Hey, random stranger. Uh, it has been well over a month now since we last read Hoseki no Kuni, and I hope you've been doing well. I also apologize for the wait, but I did put that time to good use, and I actually reread all 92 chapters from the very beginning to refresh my memory. Uh, my brain almost broke doing that, but I'm glad I did it because once we're done with these last three chapters today, we can have a proper yarn about what makes Hoseki, um, its characters, its lore, and this world that Ichikawa has built so unique and just so freaking good. As well as talk about any unanswered questions that I think we'll be left with, um, and just like overall feelings about what I consider to be a real piece of art. It is crazy to me that we're going to be finishing Hoseki no Kuni today and finishing because judging by how the story is going, it seems like Ichikawa has a lot more plot to drop on us whenever she gets around to doing that. Um, some of you have been here since the very beginning when I posted my first video to this channel reacting to the anime. Uh, it would have been well over a year ago now. And before we get into the recap, I just wanted you to know that it's been an absolute pleasure to get to read and to share in your thoughts um, and discuss Hoseki no Kuni with you for this whole time. Even if you haven't left any comments, just knowing that there are people watching and reading along with me has made the experience uh, of Hoseki no Kuni so rewarding. It really helps to have people to vent to when something insane is happening in the story, which is like almost all the time. And you guys have really helped me notice these critical details in the narrative and the symbolism and the illustrations as well that I never would have picked up on on my own. And so I just wanted to thank you guys for sticking it out with me to the end. All right, let's get into the recap of what happened last time. Uh, let's start with a thing that seemingly came out of nowhere, which is that Congo had a as yet unnamed rogue AI brother who somehow caused the first meteor to strike the earth. And foremost in my mind still, even after all this time, is how. Like The only possible explanation I could come up with is that Congo's brother miscalculated the meteor's flight path such that the humans didn't activate whatever planetary missile defense system they had, assuming they had one because there's no indication that they did, uh, which then allowed the meteor to hit. Uh, we're also told that Congo's brother did this because he wanted to wrest control from the humans. And the vagueness of that didn't escape me. And I think we're just meant to accept the AI turns evil, wants to overthrow evil, you know, human overlords trope and just leave it at that. I I did feel that Barbados short spiel revealing the entire history of how the humans were destroyed was rushed. Um, in no way did it ruin the story for me, but I gotta say last time there was an unusual number of hand wavy retcons. Um, for example, the other just tiny little detail of why the next five meteorites hit Earth was dealt with in like two sentences. Basically it's because humans couldn't trust the machines anymore and presumably without that trust and the protection of the machines, they were left defenseless. So it's like there's a logical progression there, but the gaps are kind of huge and we the readers have to fill them in ourselves so um, yeah I agree with Nucleus Snake's comment that all of that makes for a really convenient if somewhat thin explanation for why Congo was programmed and restricted in the way that he was uh, and beyond that it doesn't really matter <sighs> Although, like, if I had to wear my critic's hat, I, I do wish that this all-important story of how humans came to be destroyed wasn't dealt with in such an abrupt manner. 
one because of how central that story has been to how the present three races exist but also too because of how long it's been teased in past volumes uh but yeah it is what it is and we can talk more about it later when we review the entire story about how um Hoseki as brilliant as it is does have these a few plot holes you know where it's better to kind of just like shut one eye and not think too deeply about so yeah we're, we're given what we're given and then we just have to let the rest of the plot move forward okay so fast forward to the many souls who are left unprayed for and became the lunarians um and there was enough of them to fill all six moons but there is a serious clog in the prayer pipeline because congo the only being who is capable of prayer at this point is damaged and can only pray for a few souls a day. And so to sort out the order in which uh, you get prayed for, the Linarians institute this caste system that ranks them based on how good their souls are. And it turns out that the Linarians that we've come to know and love, like Cicada and Barbada, were the worst of the worst. So not only were they last in line to get prayed for, but also they got cast into this giant garbage pit. And only when a member of the upper caste, Ikmir or Enma, takes pity on them, do they recover some semblance of dignity or worth. Uh, but by then, Sensei has completely broken down and has stopped praying altogether. Okay, there's a lot to unpack right there. First, we're told the caste system was organized by the goodness of one soul because as pure spirits, Lunarians could no longer be ranked by race or gender or I guess anything related to their bodily or their human existence, which implies that when they were still humans, uh, people were distinguished by race or gender and or any other physical or sexual attributes. Which, if true, would have been real shitty, and maybe humans deserve to die out. And maybe Congo's brother was the real hero. He saw how these humans treat each other based on, you know, inherent traits like race, and was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> I don't think these people deserve to live anymore. And so just wiped them off the face of the earth. I don't know. We'll just never know, I guess. The second thing that would have been really interesting to get into, but we're not really given much to go on in the text, is exactly how the goodness of one's soul was measured. Like, was it judged based on the sum total of a Lunarian's actions in their past human life? Or was it more of um, a minority report type situation where there was some premonition or some soul weighing mechanism that determined someone's propensity for criminality or for badness and if it was the latter then we could have really gotten into the weeds of like pre-crime and just that whole nefarious branch of criminology that presupposes certain types of people will always commit crimes which almost always never turns out to be true either way i think it would be controversial God, did I say controversial? Controversial regardless because who got to decide what's good and what's bad and based on what authority? And if Lunarian society uh, like post-annihilation was in some way reflective of human society as it existed, then it suggests again that humans sucked because there was an authoritarian group of Lunarians who wielded the power to send certain groups of other Lunarians into a hell pit without any sort of due process, at least none that we are made aware of. Thirdly, uh, Chief Enma, and Nisenol brought up a very cool point, which is that Enma is another name for Yama in Buddhist mythology, i.e. The king of hell, or the one who judges the dead and decides whether they suffer or are born into good or bad afterlives. And Nightingale also wrote, The fact that Ikmir gave up his place in line in order to help the others really makes me think of him as a bodhisattva. 
it's interesting that he's encompassing these two concepts. Yeah, uh, Ikmir's allusion to both the judge of the dead and a bodhisattva brings up several points of irony. Enma, or Yama, at least in some strands of Buddhism, presides over the cycle of rebirth, this never-ending cycle. Ikmya, however, is all about ending that cycle. Uh, Enma is about judging the goodness of one's soul and following through with an appropriate punishment or reward, whereas Ikmya, or the Enma in our story, rejected that line of thinking and took pity on those judged to be bad. In relation to Ikmya being a bodhisattva, so remember in the Japanese strand of Buddhism, a bodhisattva is someone who has attained enlightenment but chooses to remain on earth to help others move on to nirvana, which is what Ikmya did, albeit on the moon. He chose to build this magnificent city for those left behind and to figure out a way for all of them to go into nothingness together. It's ironic also when you compare Ikmia to the other Bodhisattva figure in this story, which is Congo. Congo's literal name and function as a prayer machine pins him as a Bodhisattva, but unlike Ikmia, who had a choice to stay behind, Congo didn't. The only reason he remained on Earth was because he was indestructible, and as soon as a sense of a uh, choice or self awoke in Congo because of his love for the gems, his choice was not to bring about nirvana um, or nothingness. And it's those kinds of ironies and just lit- literary connections that just make me stop and think sometimes like, God damn it, Hoseki no Kuni, despite what flaws it does have, is just a masterpiece. There were other lore-related things Barbados said that, again, um, unfortunately I felt wasn't explained enough or possibly will be explained in future chapters, but somehow just a gut feeling says that they won't be, that they were more put there to quickly paper over some gaps in the story. Uh, One of them was the head scratcher about the ice flows. So from Nuclear Snake, I didn't understand why the ice flows ended up the way they are. The Lunarians in the Chimera region were pretty bad, apparently, the dregs of humanity, and they became spirits just fine, so why not the ice flows? Um, I don't really get it either, mate. (laughs) We kind of knew, and Sensei hinted at it as well, that the ice flows, you know, are remnants of the humans who were destroyed. The confusing part is, as you point out, like what distinguished them from the Lunarians. We're told certain humans became weak desires and sank into the ocean. So just like the Lunarians, their souls, or at least a part of their souls, lived on, but they ended up in a completely different situation to those who then became Lunarians. And as far as I could see, there's no explanation for this divergence in soul pathways. If I had to take a wild stab, maybe the humans who became the ice flows were much weaker in spirit compared to those who became Lunarians. Like, they were terrible people and they didn't even have enough fight in them to become fully fledged Lunarians. And they were just juiced down to their most basic state of mind. It's actually, on that, you know, um, thought, it's intriguing to think that the Isolays were really the runts of humanity, and that's why Foss developed a connection with them, and why the Isolays themselves are apparently concerned for Foss when Foss became depressed. Um, that, that connection is there, not just, just because Foss... Uh, became a pseudo-human, but also because they share a similar burden of being the lowest of the low in their respective societies. The other thing I wasn't able to figure out logically is Barbados story of when and how Sensei broke. So the Lunarians lived in the city that Enma built for them while continuing to wait in line to be prayed for. 
At that point, Sensei is already damaged and hence why he can only pray for a few Lunarians at a time. And then Barbada goes on to say that around when Jem started being born is when Sensei broke even more in that he stopped praying completely. We know it's because he came to love the gems, which caused his prayer function to just shut down, um, probably because deep inside he doesn't want his gem kids to disappear along with the Lunarians, if he does pray. But therein lies the problem. If before the gems were born, Sensei was only capable of praying for a few Lunarians at a time, why was it that after he found the gems, Ikmia assumed that Sensei's praying would make everyone, including the gems and the Admirabilis, to disappear all at the same time. Because that would mean that Congo's powers had somehow been restored to full capacity, just blocked off. But there's no mention of that anywhere, unless Ikmia was wrong. You know, that's possible. So... Basically what I'm saying is, according to Ikmia, Congo either can't pray at all, or if he does pray, everyone goes away at the same time. That was fine, until we were told that before the gems came into being, Congo was already broken and occupied like a kind of middle state in between those two, in that when he prayed, only a few souls at a time went into nothingness, which is why they had to come up with the whole caste system. So <laughs> I have folded my mind into a pretzel thinking about this and I still couldn't come up with anything. So if you have answers, please let me know. Um, either that or we accept that maybe this part of the story got away from Ishikawa and it's just an inconsistency that we're going to have to live with. All right, let's talk about the insanity that unfolded at the school. It's like Foss had to get past three bosses. I mean, well, okay, more like step over Yeek, then fight Jade, the minor boss, and then finally Cinnabar, the big boss. So, okay, let's start with Yeek. Whenever Yeek comes up in the comments, I sense a lot of mixed feelings around their character and just around the sincerity of their intentions and I get it like I get why people get irked at Yuke. Um, in my mind like Yuke's heart is in the right place. I did appreciate how open they were to accepting Congo as equals and to try and build a better happier society based on trust and tolerance and did succeed for a time in doing that. However, Yuke's actions haven't always lined up with the nice conciliatory words that they say, you know, and people have brought this up before that Yuke's hypocrisy was really noticeable, especially the first time that Foss came down with Yellow and Pudpa, uh, admittedly with an intention to get at Sensei, but Foss was definitely more amenable to talking back then. Yuk, though, set Rutil on them in an attack first, talk later strategy. And that to me was Yuk blowing up their last good chance of coming to a peaceful solution, like regardless of how much they said that they wanted that. So when Yuk, last time when you bent the knee to Foz, who by the way is like revenge incarnate and just pure hellfire focus, and Yuk says all the right words again, like that they just want to talk, this time even with the Lunarians and Ikmia, that the fact that everyone is immortal must mean that, you know, they can come to some solution everyone is happy with. Those words, they fall kind of flat. Did Foss need to decapitate Yuke in that way? Not at all. Is Yuke completely to blame for how far gone Foss is? Nope. But they're not completely blameless either, and that's, uh, I guess, the beauty of our second Okini. Like, we get to witness these layers of mistakes from everyone, and these compounding tragedies and misunderstandings such that no one person, least of all Yuke, is completely to blame or blameless. And yeah, it's actually what Harrix300 wrote um, in the comments. So. I think what makes the story and the characters so good is how well Ichikawa understands the selfishness of people 
Everyone is selfish in Hoseki no Kuni. In this conflict, the Lunarians may be more violent and aggressive, but you easily understand them when you know that the whole issue started with Congo abandoning their cause and duty to help the Lunarians due to developing personal attachments. In the conflict between Foss and the rest of the gems, even though Foss is the one who caused the crisis, uh, the other side is not blameless. We can remember the times when the conflict could be solved with less amount of violence if the gems treated Foss uh, better. Yeah, Foss is an actual monster now, but we saw their story and know that they are mostly a victim of their tragic role. Though still a monster. <laughs> um, yeah, I I have no qualms calling Foss like a raging psychopath at this point. They are incapable of feeling shame or regret or even love, but the way they ended up like that is the result of so many different actors and factions. So yeah, that's just just a big like clusterfuck, basically. So minor boss Jade. My favorite callback in this fight was when Jade slices Foss straight through the middle. Exactly what they had to do the first time that Foss's gold alloy tried to destroy them from the inside out. Except this time, Jade is not hesitant and won't be traumatized because they wanted to stop Foss from getting to Congo. And what made this time different too is that getting sliced through the middle uh, doesn't actually stop Foss. They are vastly more difficult to put down, and even when Jade successfully uh, breaks the gem parts of Foss, the gold alloy just pulls Foss back together again repeatedly. And what struck me about that is how dominant the gold alloy is now and what that symbolizes. So the gold alloy, more than Lapis's head or the agate legs or the pearl eye, represents the humanness of Foss. Um, and note I didn't say humanity because that encompasses the quality of being benevolent or compassionate, neither of which Foss is. So when Foss cries for the first time, which according to Congo is a human weakness, it's gold alloy that leaks out of their eyes. The more Foss activates the alloy, the more original parts of themselves break off, representing their shedding off of their gem selves and they're becoming more and more human. Um, and on the moon, Foss even starts to lose Lapis's presence and intelligence, like the more they use the alloy. Also, um, the liquidness of the alloy not only goes against the commonly held gem belief that hardness equals strength, um, the liquidness has also been associated with the two gems, Cinnabar and Foss, who really struggled with fitting into this expectation of a gem to know their purpose and their place in society. So whenever Cinnabar and Foss got super emotional, they would be unable to control the liquidy parts of themselves from lashing out. And that uncontrollability was usually linked to this, you know, feeling lost as to what they can contribute to the gem society. So uncertainty of purpose and intense emotion, like these are very human things represented by liquid alloys. And by the time that we get to this final fight, Foss is pretty much mostly a fountain of alloy with like a pearl eye stuck on them. So the fight with Jade ends with Foss pinning Jade to the wall and then Jade suddenly apologizing for not making more of an effort to understand Foss. And while I don't think Jade's apology fell as flat as Yuke's overtures for peace, I still think at this point it was something Jade knew came too late and it wouldn't make a jot of difference, but it was still something that they had to get out regardless. Which brings us to the fight of the century, Cinnabar versus Foss. I do not have enough words or good things to say about how well this fight was illustrated and constructed. Um, not only was the physicality of the fight drawn beautifully, but there were several really key symbolic moments that set up this profound contrast between two characters who shared so much in terms of their struggles in society 
and also their support and even affection for each other at some point in the past. First off, when Cinnabar appears in the distance, they're making an Enso circle with their Mercury, uh, which is a beautiful image because uh, remember that the Enso, which looks like an imperfect uh, unclosed circle, symbolizes the acceptance of or or even an embrace of imperfection and it also points to like letting go of expectations and just accepting oneself so right off the bat there's that gratifying I guess symbolic confirmation that Cinnaba has finally found their place and their peace they started off in an even worse position than Foss you know with how ostracized they were from everyone else but Cinnabar's kindness and their genuine desire to care about the other gems, as well as their empathy with Congo, has really paid off. Contrast that to Foss, who sadly could have had all of that too, I think, but because of differences in how uh, Cinnabar and Foss approached this problem of the Lunarians and their suspicions of Congo, Foss is no longer the kind gem that they once were and they've lost any purpose other than to destroy everything. And I love that Cinnabar confronts Foss with that by recreating this figurine of Foss as they used to be. That was some strong psychological warfare, and you can tell Foss is shook. What's um, interesting is that Cinnabar still is the gem that Foss is most willing to talk to, and before they start fighting, is even trying to convince Cinnabar to join their side and to see how the other gems have been using them. That was probably just like pure manipulation on Foss's part, but you know, compared to the other gems, like Foss gives Cinnabar the time of day. But Cinnabar is so secure in their newfound place among the gems and their friendships with them that I think it ends up pissing off Foss. And part of that I felt is because it is painful to see someone who started off worse than you, now enjoy the very acceptance and purpose that you've wanted or you used to want. And so Foss ends up being an asshole towards Cinnabar. And one of the things Foss said which really struck me was that the other gems only pitied Cinnabar because of how awkward they are. And it made me like think, like, wait, maybe that's what Foss was doing even at the start, you know, of their relationship with Cinnabar. Like, going out of their way to find Cinnabar a new job and venturing out into the ocean with Ventricosis, you know, maybe it wasn't purely out of kindness towards Cinnabar, but the sort of pity that Foss is now trying to pin on the other gems, which is ironic because it's clear that Bort and the other gems have truly embraced Cinnabar for who they are, which is more than what Foss can say of themselves. The fight that spread um, was on page six with Foz and Cinnabar just releasing their respective gold alloy and the mercury was insanity. They're, um, it was so cool, they're like simultaneously shielding themselves and attacking the other person. And the impression I got throughout that fight was, uh, so both of them went emotional, like pour out liquid uncontrollably, but in that fight, Cinema really stood out as being in control and super strategic with how they deployed their Mercury to hold Foss at bay. It was like, yeah, it was all control as opposed to Foss's just crazy lashing out. When Cinema's limbs get snapped off, uh, Cinema just recreates them using the Mercury and the Mercury like takes on the forms of gems or I think someone said it was like copies of themselves to attack Foss. Like, one of the things that really struck hard too, um, yeah, it was mentioned by Nightingale, uh, who pointed out that uh, one of the pages had a note about Cinnabar, Cinnabar versus Foss, uh, a job only Cinnabar can do. Another call back to how that in itself was one of Foss's original goals. Well, in a twisted way, it seems like Foss has achieved it. Yeah, so only Cinnabar is capable of matching Foss in combat at this stage. And at one point, Foss even looked scared when Cinnabar like covers them mercilessly with Mercury. And 
I did wonder because of how mercury dissolves gem parts and consequently any memories that are contained in the inclusions that Foss being totally covered in mercury was a sign and meant to suggest that they've well and truly lost like 99.9% of their original memories including the ones where they actually liked Cinnabar. Here's another uh, really helpful comment from Mikhail Gorin. Uh, so this went over my head the first time I was reading the chapter, but when Foss said, um, you can be easily broken, you pathetic two, the pathetic two referred to Cinnabar's hardness, um, which of course it did, and man, Foss, that was a really low blow. <laughs> uh, also, Mikhail Gorin wrote, you should remember that mercury is one of the few things that can affect gold. Mercury dissolves gold, forming a type of alloy called amalgam and it does so quite effectively. Right, so at the peak of this fight, when both of them are giving as much as they can and Cinnabar's gem copies are clawing at Foss, and Foss panics and slices their heads off, Cinnabar takes that opportunity to get right up in Foss's face, and they have this look of just pure de determination. And so they're both like spewing out their mercury and their gold alloy, and in that final clash, this spiky looking thing forms, which is the amalgam that Mikhail Gorin mentioned. So um, an amalgam is like an alloy that forms from mercury combining with another metal. It can be liquid or solid or somewhere in between depending on um, how much mercury there is. Uh, in real life, mercury is used in gold mining to separate out the flecks of gold from like gravel or from other heavy minerals. So yeah, I guess today we'll find out what the amalgam is going to do to Foss. Like, maybe it'll be the thing that finally stops them because it somehow extracts all of the gold alloy out of the rest of them. I don't really know. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll comment on before getting to the chapters is that... Um, so recall that symbolically, Mercury or its you know other form, Cinnabar, was a key ingredient of the Philosopher's Stone or like immortality elixirs, which I think gives another interesting twist to this amalgam that Foss and Cinnabar have inadvertently made. Given that Foss's ultimate aim now is to, like after destroying everyone, is to end their life, which is like the direct opposite of immortality. So yeah, Hoseki no Kuni is just thick with these ironies and we're about to find out how everything goes down and I'm nervous about it but here we go. Chapter 93, promise. It just looks like a pancake and they're both underneath that amalgam thing. Oh I am gonna read the notes in the margins this time. Foss and Cinnabar's furious battle where Alloy and Mercury collide. There was once a time when Foss thought tirelessly of what he could do for Cinnabar. <sighs> there was a time. A long, long past now. And I know that I said that there's a possibility that Foss's intentions weren't entirely pure, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that they genuinely wanted to help Cinnabar, you know. I think it was just maybe mixed in with pity. The thing that Foss is trying to accuse the other gems of. Who is that? That's Foss. Is that Foss? I don't even know. <sighs> no, that's... that's Cinema. With their head on a spike. And Foss just underneath there, staring at them while they spearheaded Cinnabar's brain. <sighs> Thanks to you, I could be with everyone else. I enjoyed it. Thanks for your promise. Oh, <laughs> oh man. So nice, no, you were right. Like, this is Cinnabar fulfilling 
the one purpose or the one job that only they could do. I don't know if they've stopped FOSS, but they definitely were the last line of defense and the gem's last hope of protecting Congo. They definitely had a cave everything of themselves to do that. And no one can blame them, you know. Damn. <sighs> what Foss must be thinking now? Like, screw you. <laughs> like, I wanted that, you know, relationship with everyone. And now look at me. Whereas you get this sort of heroic death. Not death, because I don't die, but this heroic end. <sighs> oh, man. Just... Can they be recovered from that? That's mercury. Well, it's an amalgam now, so I don't know what that does to the gem parts because it looks like not everything is dissolved what am i doing yo the amalgam has sort of formed like a dress <laughs> around us right i'm making adamant prey if he prays, the Lunarians will disappear and we won't fight anymore. If that happens, I'll bring you and everyone else back. First off, Foss still doesn't know that Congo can't pray. Which is Ikmir's fault. I don't even know. Like, And second of all, it sounds like they're still intent on bringing all the gems back. But I don't know. There's just, I feel like they're seesawing between having that purpose of ending the war that somehow survived all of their physical and mental changes and also just being completely just bent on revenge. Just, just you wait. Wait, what does that say down the bottom? From Harigo, Ichiko. I've been watching tech videos lately and it makes me want to get a camera. <laughs> Stalking through the hallways of the school. What did he mean by promise? Oh, they don't remember their promise. Okay, my body feels heavy. That reminds me of Yellow, who also had that issue of wanting to be a Lunarian, a spirit, but their body is just feeling so heavy. And all the other gems too, which is why they wanted to become something else. Split. What? The Mercury. The Mercury has become part of Foss now. Yo, they're starting to look like a full-on human with skin. Although that also sort of looks like Sensei. What is happening? They are taking the form of a human. Oh, it looks like, I don't know, like, <laughs> it's taking on flesh, a fleshy kind of shape. And then the skin's wrapping around, well, the mercury is wrapping around, like, sort of like a skeleton and the flesh and the muscles. Ugh. Was Master's desk always so far away? Oh, 
I just can't shake that they are looking more and more like Congo. <laughs> this is weird. Who's that? Oh no, there's a gem left. Wait, is that Morga? No. What? <laughs> Adorable. That's just in their imagination, right? And look at that, um, the shape of like the lotus bloom. The foss sees the light. He's just waiting for them, just in his original position, like when he was still their sensei. Oh man, I can't. Foss looks so different. <laughs> I mean, as they would be, they've been through so much. Oh, that look of like. I don't know, do they have any memories in them? That's... Master, my job is to make you pray. They're still calling Congo Master or Sensei. Could you please? Do that for me. They're so polite. I'm sorry. I must say this again, but I have an error. However often I try, the results are never what we'd like them to be. Then, you know what is so interesting is that Foss is in is relatively in their right mind now after they took on the human form and sort of <laughs> reconstructed themselves but i have a feeling they're just gonna explode again yeah there we go break yo <laughs> the indestructible diamond or adamant has broken yeah, so the supposedly toughest in the world adamant cracks at Foss's word. Oh, it wasn't even they physically smashed him. It was an order that came from a human. Oh, it's end of chapter 93. That is fascinating that programmed in Sensei is the command to basically self-destruct. Oh, so he needed a human to... Well, it makes sense because of course the humans would want to preserve their power to, you know, unmake Congo if they ever needed to. You know, if he ever became evil like his brother. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that makes me so sad when looking at Foss's original form. With their nice, you know, green hair and innocent eyes. Okay. Uh, chapter 94, Adamant. Um, Land of the Lustrous. Okay. Then break at Foss's command, Adamant cracks. <laughs> I love these little uh, recaps. It could be said that Foss became a marvellous human like Ichmia said he would. I have been waiting for so long for a human to let me know that my work is done. Oh my god. The irony that Foss came to Adamant to end their lives, to go into nothingness. But instead, it's Foss who has released Congo from this never-ending immortality as an indestructible machine who hasn't fulfilled his original purpose for a very very long time <laughs> i'm just gonna piss fuss off even more they're like i came here not to satisfy your wants <laughs> you're meant to do what i want you to do thank you Take my right eye. 
And then you should just pray wholeheartedly for happiness. Oh my gosh, he is disintegrating from the inside out. Yo, so his eye... Was that all part of Ikima's plan as well? When he said he's going to make Foss into something even more than a human? So with Sensei's eye, Foss becomes becomes the higher power to which everyone else prays and they can pray for themselves oh this my okay my mind is just like going at a thousand kilometers an hour he's gone he's just turned into like diamond dust so the only part of him that doesn't disintegrate is his eye. <sighs> Happiness. Swish. Oh god. <laughs> Wait, okay, so with the mercury, because remember mercury is liquid silver, so technically I think Foss completed the treasure tower and thus became fully human, as evidenced by the fact that they were able to give Sensei the command to break. But now with Congo's eye, does that then elevate them from being fully human to fully god? God. Eh? Ikmia? I don't think that's Ikmia. Ikmia, is it you? Wait, has Foss put their eye in already? No, they're putting them in now. They're putting it in now. Could it be... The whole time you were after this? Oh, that is Ikmia. <laughs> <laughs> Fuss has been played and they just realized it. Look at that evil smile of Ikmia's. That is Ikmia for sure, right? They've been monitoring Fuss through the pearl eye and they're like, yep, got him. <laughs> Whoosh, gonna try and like slash at Ikmia. Drip. Bang. So they can't touch Ikmia. What is that? Ikmia just launched them out <laughs> into space. Rattle. Oh my gosh, how is Ikmia doing this? <sighs> I'm confused. Bang, splat. So Foss is totally powerless against this form of Ikmia, even though... I mean, we don't even know if that's Ikmia, but for all intents and purposes, it probably is. <laughs> How are they so powerful on Earth, though? I don't know. Happiness. I want happiness. Oh, now they've put their eye in. <laughs> and evil Ikmia looks like they've just won the whole gambit. Oh, the eye just like sank into the the alloy or the amalgam or whatever fuss is now. And that's it. They just disappeared. It's just fuss now. 
I need to put them back together. Master? You are the master now. <laughs> I can't believe they're still looking for Congo. Like, I don't know. Foss in this state seems kind of reasonable. Like, glimpses of the past gem that they used to be. They're all alone. Do they even know how to put the gems back together? They don't have the tech. They're all gone. There. What? Some Lunarian party happening? Whoa, no, 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 no. Oh, that's all the gems that were scooped up by the Lunarians. Are you freaking kidding me? What? <laughs> so it was the plan, it was Ichmia's plan all along to have Foss destroy all the gems, become human, and then destroy Sensei so that they then could become godlike with Congo's eye. And then in the meantime, they'll just pick up all the pieces that's Foss destroyed. <laughs> yeah, there's like Padpa and I see parts of uh, Yik is there. Yep, they're all there and the Lunarians are just having a having a celebration at this, you know, windfall of gem bits. What is that? Are they seeing that city? Is it, that's not actually there, right? That's in the ocean? <laughs> Atlantis? Something's wrong with my eye. It's acting funny. Even when I cover my eyes, I can still see it. Oh, those are the meteors. Wait, this was, is that the city as it was before it was destroyed by the meteorites? Ah. Uh, yeah, it's like some kind of vision of the past as Congo saw it. Maybe. This planet was broken apart six times by meteors, an enormously long time before today. And yet... So... <laughs> Given Foss is seeing this through Congo's eye, does that then mean that Congo every day was subject to this repeated vision of how the world ended? That, no wonder why he just wanted, he was so happy when Foss ended his life. Big things are happening among the moon gems as well. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my god, my brain is going to break by the time we're done. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Oh, the sensei with Shiro. Oh, I love that. Shiro, as Shiro was, you know, before he got turned into some hulking Lunarian monster. Chapter 95, end of the fight. I'm back. Okay, so it was Ikmiel. The Oh my god, I have so many issues with Ikmiya, which we'll get to <laughs> when we finish. <sighs> Welcome home! Of course, princess. I was glad to see him return. Ikmia returns from the earth. Black boxes seem to be filled with pieces of gems. We had an excellent outcome. Us too. Oh my gosh. Are they going to, they need the gem bodies to, I don't know. It has something to do with the crater, right? With the ice crystals. 
we've done the final adjustments. The gem to Lunarian Transformation Machine is complete. What the hell? We call it... So Amethyst and the others continue their studies into gem memories, and now they have a freaking machine to turn themselves into Lunarians. The gem to Lunarian Transformation Machine. <laughs> A plus for efforts, like a big fat F for originality. With the efforts of everyone involved, we were able to achieve perfect results in every simulation. All that's left is the live test. No, this is what they need the gems for, to test their machine. This is so messed up, man. Amethyst. Amethyst, come on. You're better than that. <laughs> Princess, straight away. <laughs> Wait! Why? You can't use it, Princess. Isn't it complete? Of course it is. But on the one in a million chance something happens to you, it would be so unforgivable that they'd find my dust all the way to Venus. The, 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 the right thing is for the researcher to test it themselves. And what if that off-chance thing happens to the researcher? Sounds fun. <laughs> Kosh. Kosh first. <laughs> the brashness or the bravery of youth. I don't know. Oh my. <sighs> okay. Okay, so it seems like they did not take the other gems back up to the moon to test on them. So that's fine. Click. Is that Dyer's music? <laughs> I guess it's the stars. Tonight, I have a date at the end of the universe. I'm sure you already know. Where is this coming from? I'm different from yesterday. Take the U of every year. Isn't this Dyer's Galaxy Crazy Dancer? <laughs> I loved how you knew it was Dyer's because of the the symbols, like the musical symbols, and just recognizing the stuff that Dyer used to attack Bort. <laughs> so, Galaxy Crazy Dancer. All right. With signs you can't ignore. This song is just the length of the treatment, so it fit to use it. Oh. <laughs> and when you break and disappear, jump into the arms that spin and sweep with style that couldn't beg more. Ugh, when you break and disappear, that's sort of foreshadowing, isn't it? Like, it's like when Daya wrote the song, assuming that they did write the song, they were thinking about Bort, <laughs> and was like, after I break you, then you can jump into my arms. <laughs> Ping! The completion sound. I'm sure you already know I won't always be this way. Oh my goodness. Ta da! It worked! It did work! <laughs> and they don't look worse for wear. Woo! Now take that knee tech and roll out! Huh? Kala, bring the stabilizer! Hurry! Whoa, was Gosh about to wink out? I'm just kidding, you guys. You can use it now. <laughs> Wait. Okay, so Gosh was just messing with them and making their lines wavy so it looked like they were gonna disappear <laughs> gosh man gosh is such a joker i love them is she come on i got my ps5 yay oh there's the infamous ps5 that's why we haven't had any new chapters for months now i think it's been lunarian transformation yes oh god hey the moon gems and the earth gems finally meet well, at least 
representatives of the different factions. We could not find the memories of the gems that were taken to the moon because their inclusions had been expelled. But recently, we discovered them surfaced from the deep ice of another moon with a unique magnetic field. And so we collected them. <laughs> hey, this is like, you know, Ichikawa just being like, <laughs> hey, they discovered their memories again. And so, yay, everyone gets restored now. <sighs> this is insane. Unfortunately, I can't restore these memories to the original inclusions in the body. If we use a certain amount of pieces from the Earth storage, we can transplant some of the same parts as Lunarians have. Eh? If we use a certain amount of pieces from the Earth storage, we can transplant some of the same parts as Lunarians have. Then they'll be restored as Lunarians, won't they? Yes, that's the idea. I... okay. So basically, they do have the ground up parts of the gems that were taken to the moon. And so, while they can still be restored with their original memories, they're going to have to have the bodies of Lunarians. Is that, that's basically it, right? My first instinct is to be like, they're going to freak out and probably go crazy as soon as they realize that they've become Lunarians, <laughs> even though Amethyst is going to be there. Maybe the other ones as well being like, hey, it's okay. <laughs> this is all part of the plan. I mean, can you just imagine just waking up one day and you look down and you're like, oh my gosh, I have the body of my sworn enemy. <laughs> And, of course, we hope that you and everyone else will become Lunarians, too. Why? You'd lose your unique luster and coloration, but you would become light and there would be no physical distinctions between us, opening up a whole world of interpersonal possibilities. Interpersonal possibilities? I wrote down all the pros and cons if you're interested. I don't know why, but I, as soon as I read interpersonal possibilities I was thinking wait are they thinking of reproducing <laughs> and they they need everyone to be of the same a uh, structure in order to reproduce <laughs> because obviously they're no longer going for the whole you know going into nothingness right at least I don't think they are they're trying to build this new world for their future generations what about the others? They're asking what you're going to do. Are they Amethyst or is this some new <laughs> mental ploy by Ikmia? I don't know. There's, I always feel like there's some mind game being played whenever they're on the moon. Just because of Ikmia's reach, you know. Yuk's gonna say yes. Makes sense. <laughs> Does it? I mean, that is incredibly quick adjustment, you know, going from Lunarians are sworn enemies to we must protect Congo to now being like, yeah, I think we're good to become just like them. <laughs> then if it ends this fight between us, who is that? I can't tell, is that Antark? Oh, oh my gosh, did they already do it? Did they do the thing already? They've restored everyone's original memories in Lunarian bodies. That, oh my gosh, they gave me shivers like looking at all the containers with the gem forms in them. There's so many of them. Welagato. What do you think of that? What? It's your name. Welagato? It's a neologism. Uh, sorry, it's a neologism 
in a lost language that means abundance and transcendence. Deep. But I wanted to have a name. I like it. Wait, but... Who was that gem originally? What? Wait. Well, a gato, huh? Hehe, <laughs> that's a mouthful. <gasps> it was <laughs> Antarctica. Whoa. What happened? Why is this, their face being split in the middle? Can I talk to you? Oh, so that's Antark next to Willigato. Sorry it took so long to fix you up. I wanted to be extra careful not to let you get lonely, so I ended up dragging it out. Huh? <laughs> Wait, does that make sense? Oh, so maybe it means like he went to restoring other gems first so that when Antark woke up, they'd have like a family again. Is that what he means? Yeah. Oh, <gasps> wait, is that Congo? <laughs> Master. Is it? Oh, I have such a bad feeling about this. Oh, but this looks legit. I mean, everyone's there. So everyone's already been turned into Lunarians. What the hell? Oh my god. Where's Phosphophylite? What are they doing in the back? They're kind of just floating around everywhere. Master, what happened to him? I asked him to take care of you. He rendered me useless and allowed me to be destroyed. I am deeply grateful to him. <laughs> I cannot believe that Kogo is there. I mean, he would be because... He didn't die, but he just kind of disintegrated when Foss told him to break. And so, yeah, they would have been able to restore him just like any other gem. How convenient this <laughs> transform your gem into a Lunarian machine has been. Useless. Destroyed. <laughs> Antark, you have a lot to catch yourself up on. More accurately, he said... If only you were never here, then break. Is it, what is it, is Ancha gonna care about that now? I mean, technically, it did lead to everyone being restored and saved, and now everyone can be one big happy family together again as Lunarians. Everyone is present. Thank you, Ikmia. Ikmia. <laughs> He's an old friend. Oh, extremely sophisticated. Adamant, his real name is Enma. Is that so? Enma, the one who freed me, appears before me. You did say you would comfort me one day. Congratulations. Ho <laughs> There, that's the bromance <laughs> that's kept this whole story together. Like, the bromance between Congo and Ikmia has been the unseen backbone behind everything that's happened and behind everything Ikmia has done, as well as everything Congo has done. I need to just think about this <laughs> because. Boss really is the big loser in all of this, I feel. They were just a tool, like a pure and simple tool to get everyone to the stage. But, okay, we'll talk about it later, but I do feel like 
because this is sort of going in the direction of, oh, this is all part of Ikmi's plan. But it wasn't always Ikmi's plan to be like this. <sighs> or it was. <laughs> but I am null. I've given all information about humans and the power to dissolve you to phosphophyte. Why did you restore me? Adamant. How long does it take for you to fully transfer your power to phosphophyte? About 10,000 years. 10,000 years is a significant number in religion. I'm assuming Buddhism too. Adamant. And germs that have become Lunarians. This is the end of our hostilities. We give you the city on the moon to live on from this day forward. <gasps> Look at all the... That's... Wait, can we see any of the gems that we've come to know? That's watermelon. <laughs> you are now the citizens of my district. But the Canberra region? <laughs> so enjoy lives in safety. That's Alex and Yellow, right? In safety, comfort, and happiness. That would be the envy of your forebearers. Wait, so enjoy lives in safety, comfort, and happiness. That would be the envy of your forebearers, the humans. And so, until the new divine completes his path, have a pleasant 10,000 years. <laughs> Their happy lives as Lunarians begin, only one remains on earth. I feel so bad for Foss. Everyone gets a happy 10,000 years and then Foss will pray for them. I'm assuming, so the goal, the original goal still stands to go into nothingness. But now they have an entity who, unlike Congo, is not broken. Well, not right now at least. Oh my, I mean, is that what happened to Congo? Like, did he also have to go through the divine path, whatever Ikumi is talking about? And he had to do his 10,000 years of time before he became able to pray? That's insane. <laughs> Land of the Luscious will be on hiatus starting next issue. Oh man. How are you guys going? <laughs> I'm speechless right now. I need to take some time to think about what just happened. Okay, I'll be back. Oh man, I cannot believe that we're actually done. Uh, so here's <laughs> how we're going to do this. I'm going to spitfire my immediate thoughts about chapters 93 to 95 and then we'll launch into a bigger review of Hoseki no Kuni as a whole and I mean now that we've devoured pretty much all of the chapters there are out there and uh, yeah I hope you've got a real comfy chair because it's going to take a while and maybe grab yourself a stiff drink as well. Also, thank you, Madlad Five B, for uh, on Discord for basically welcoming me to the elite group of hiatus survivors. Um, I, to be honest, I feel a bit devastated because it has been a year-long journey, and now there's there's nothing. Like we have gone into nothingness. Uh, but I guess. I will wear my badge of suffering with pride, just knowing that no matter how much we together shall suffer this Ichikawa-imposed drought, 
we will never suffer as much as Foss did. Oh, mate, do I feel so bad for Foss. Um, not only were they manipulated from the very moment they were born by Ikmia to become this revenge, thirsty, suicidal human, but now he's also led Foss sort of like a lamb to the slaughter to become the substitute uh, divine being who has to do... 10,000 years of hard time for the sake of everyone else's comfort and then eventual salvation. Um, I mean, have I disagreed with some of Foss's choices in the past? Yes, totally. But they did start this whole mission um, with good intentions to end the war, and they genuinely, I think, wanted to help the gems. Um, so I don't think they deserved what happened to them um, in these last few chapters. And on balance, like Foss is, is both incredibly flawed and also has been incredibly wronged, I think predominantly by Ikmia. All right, let's uh, start with Foss's fight with Cinnabar and how that ended. I have oddly mixed feelings specifically about what Cinnabar said to Foss um, and also Cinnabar as a character now which I hate, like I hate sussing Cinnabar because I have always loved them and they've always been one of my favorite gems. Like I said in the intro, you know, I love that Cinnabar was able to accept themselves or had started to anyway um, and got to experience these really wholesome relationships with the other gems. But their last words to Foss uh, essentially were, thank you for being a traitor and making such a mess of things because without you doing that, I never would have had a reason to work with the other gems and earn their respect and become a family with them. And so I'm I'm so torn. Like to be fair, I think I think you can interpret those parting words in a favorable or a, an unfavorable light. Like cinemas either just spitting facts or they revealed themselves to be selfish or even manipulative in how they exploited Foss's actions and choices to advance their own interests. Um, so let me explain. So the more f uh, favorable reading of this is that it wasn't Cinnabar's fault, you know, that that Foss chose to pursue the truth about Congo and then chose to go to the moon and ate up all of Ikmia's words and then ultimately chose to set themselves against the Earth Gems. So when Cinema thanked Foss for their promise to find them another job, um, only they could do, which turned out to be becoming the last line of defense against Foss. And before that, I guess advising the others on how to handle Foss, you could say all of that was just Cinema uh, stepping up when they were needed, you know, to help protect Congo and defend against a Foss who was no longer the Foss that they knew um, and a Foss who was bent on destroying them all. But, and this is a massive but, um, way back when Foss came back from the moon uh, for the first time and pretended to not remember anything, they had gone to Cinnabar and told them everything, just basically laid out all their cards, including why the Lunarians keep attacking um, and about Congo being a prayer machine and how they needed to figure out a way for him to work again, to pray in order to prevent more gems from being taken. And so already Cinema was aware of Foss's more noble intentions. And like, yeah, sure, you know, Foss went on to say some pretty shitty things about Congo not being born the same way as them and therefore not deserving of their sympathy, let alone their love. But the fact that Cinnabar knew Foss was trying to stop the war for everyone's sake and not simply betraying the gems and leading the others astray is critical because um, later when the others discover Foss and some gems have left for the moon and are all broken up about it, Cinnabar was about to say something and I suspect it was something about how Foss wasn't really in an alliance with the Lunarians, but was attempting to permanently end the war by making Congo pray. Uh, but they stop, right? Because Bort beats them to the punch and declares Foss a traitor and a coward. And then afterwards, even when Bort gives Cinnabar a chance to say what they were going to say, they don't. I think 
had Sinoba spoken up then about Foster's intentions and sort of relayed the far more complex reality of the situation, the other gems would have been far more sympathetic to Foss and probably wouldn't have been so anti Foss when Foss came back a second time. Because um, remember, also, Yuke had wondered what Foss meant when um, they begged Sensei or, Sensei or Kongo to pray for the sake of everyone's happiness. But, you know, Yuke and Jade couldn't piece it together because they didn't have enough information. Information Cinnaba actually had ages ago, but withheld from all of them. So, okay, so I have this bad feeling that Cinnaba might have calculated that the others treating Foss as a full-blown traitor would open up a new and important role for them. Um, like the gems, the earth gems needed to prepare for a future Lunarian attack with Foss the traitor helping them and they would need someone, you know, aside from Bort, who was capable of meeting Foss head-on in combat, particularly someone who could match their powerful gold alloy. And more importantly, the, I guess the shock of Foss and the others betraying them triggered a desire in the earth gems to build a different a better, more tolerant society, and I guess band together as those loyal enough to not have left. It's like the classic um, having an external enemy unites the people, you know, whether it makes sense or not to determine something or someone as the enemy. And I think Cinnabon knew that too, like which was another reason why they kept quiet about what really was motivating Foss to act the way that they did. You know, they did have... Um, uh, they were acting for the good of the other gems, even though it didn't look like it. It just seemed like they were, they were siding with the Lunarians against them. Um, and if Tinnaba did do all of that, withholding that information for those reasons, that would be like peak manipulation on Cinnaba's part. Um, and it only really clicked for me that that was a possibility when Cinnaba thanked Foss for being the reason that the other gems accepted them. And I hate having my image of Cinnabar tainted like that, but I think there is enough there combined with everything that happened before and what Cinnabar didn't say to the other gems that sort of casts a shadow on Cinnabar's intentions. Foss absorbing uh, Cinnabar's mercury was also profound in several ways and it was just really cool the symbolism that was going on there. So first it seemed like it completed their full transition into a human. As they're like dragging themselves to Congo's office, the Mercury like fully, uh, I guess, amalgamated with the gold alloy. And that's when Foss took on that very human looking form. And it reminded me of when Foss saw that clipboard that they used to save Cinnaba. And seeing that helped Foss reshape back into like human form again and just sort of calm down. And you know what, to get a bit sentimental here, uh, you know how Foss has said repeatedly that they would never forget anything to do with Cinnabar? Like they said it after Retail scraped away flecks of mercury off them for the first time. And then after that 102 year jump when they woke up with a new head. In a way, Foss hasn't forgotten. You know, or at least subconsciously they haven't. Because whenever Foss has come into contact with something uh, Cinnabar related, it's always... Um, it's always helped them return to being more level-headed and just reasonable, sort of more like their former self before they completely lost their sanity. So yeah, that's a bit sad thinking about how in that way Foss has never forgotten Cinnabar. Um, and then secondly, as I mentioned before, um, Mercury was a key ingredient in immortal well, immortality elixirs. So to me, it was a clear foreshadowing of Foss unknowingly taking that next step towards becoming the next divine being or the next Congo. Um, and speaking of Congo, like, was it just me or did Foss start looking almost exactly like him and even acting like him? Um, there was that super strange part where a gem, uh, probably an illusion of some kind, ran in front of Foss um, and Foss calls it adorable. Probably something Congo said too, like, the first time they came, he came across Red Diamond. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that gem that ran across 
um, in front of us kind of looked like red dye, right? Um, anyway, there's just the parallels there are just too strong. Which leads us to when the ultimate uh, Uno reverse card was played against Foss. Instead of Foss being released from their eternal suffering, their lashing out at Congo and ordering him to break led to Congo's release from his misery of being like a savior machine that no longer fulfilled his function and basically caused Foss to become the new divine sucker. Um, something I am confused about though is that it was Congo who urged Foss to take his right eye and pray for happiness. And when I read that, I was like, wait, has Congo been in on Igmir's plan to turn Foss into a god this whole entire time? And you know what? I don't even know anymore. I wouldn't be surprised. Like, what muddies it even more is that later we witness that bromance between Ikmia and Congo. <laughs> like, Ikmia, you know, revives Congo, uh, or at least his spirit, and they share this moment when Congo is thanking Ikmia for freeing him, and Congo says, um, well, you did say that you would comfort me one day. What was that? Like, <laughs> I need backstory, and I need it now. My guess is that because Ikmia was, like, part of the upper echelons of society um he might have been part of the project team that managed congo and his praying for everyone maybe which would explain also why he knows so much about how congo works and doesn't work um and maybe probably came to care for him through that process because remember this thing called the armor of love cicada said that even lunarians couldn't hate congo and so was that the armor of love at work on Ikmia? If so, like, was all of his lecturing the gems about how they should set themselves free from the influence of Congo's love, all of that just comes off as hypocritical bullcrap now. <laughs> but, like, here's the main reason why something feels wrong. I feel like Congo threw Foss under the bus. <laughs> like, all this time we thought Congo was at loggerheads with Lunarians because he was unable to release them through prayer due to his being um, broken by his love for the gems and his desire to provide them with a paradise on earth. At the same time, you know, Ikmia did awful things to Congo and the gems over the millennia, like grinding his gem kids into sand to display for Congo on the moon, uh, to see and to be eaten by admirables, um, sending down gems whose minds had been broken, you know, giving gems and Congo false hope by sending these bits and pieces of um, synthetic gems, harassing Congo and just threatening suicide if he didn't pray for them, all of that just to shock Congo and to fix him. But as soon as Ikmia sent that, that perfect sacrificial lamb, like one of Congo's own beloved kids, to take over the prayer function, Congo becomes like a full-on enabler for Ikmia. You know, Congo tells Foss obviously to take up his eye without telling them what it really means um, that they'll be taking over his tortured role as a saviour of the human race all alone. And then after he's done, Congo's like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> and then... Once he's on the moon, he's just all buddy-buddy with Ikmia. And it's like, it felt like what he's saying is, thank you, Ikmia, for ensuring that my kid Foss was mentally and physically tortured into becoming a human. And when that didn't work, thank you for, you know, antagonizing them and torturing them some more so that they would relieve me of my duties. Like, all of the things Ikmia did to Congo and the gems in the past is like nothing now. And then, it, you know, Congo is just offering up his kid so that he can be released from his, you know, pain. <sighs> and that's what, like, is it just me? Oh, but that, that just all sounds so wrong. Um, but I don't know, like, you know, at least Congo has all of his other kids with him and he just had to sacrifice the one, you know, and so the price was worth it maybe. Like sacrifice one kid so all of your other kids can live which is like an awful choice but still you know 
I just felt like Congo folded so easy, unless that was the plan this whole time. Um, yeah. The other thing I guess could contribute to this and explain this messed upness is that, you know, ever since Fuss became human, uh, and therefore, I guess, lord over Congo, his former love for Foss as a kid, as the gem kid that he really did love before, just completely evaporated. I do think Ikmia is, is brilliant. Like, he's just doing Ikmia things using deception and a highly callous disregard for Foss's free will and well-being to accomplish a greater goal. You could even argue that it's a very noble goal, you know, what he's doing, ensuring that everyone gets the chance to be prayed for and to become nothing. And and now he's not just acting on behalf of the Lunarians, but also the gems whom he was able to rescue and turn into Lunarians. It actually blows my mind that there are no gems left. You know, also it's super sad, you know, that they've being completely assimilated into Lunarian life and being. And the weird thing was, like, the only reason they were able to restore all the gems as Lunarians was because of that massive-ass deus ex machina that was the gem to Lunarian transformation machine <laughs> and the fact that they miraculously found all of the original memories of the ground-up gems hidden away in the ice of that other moon. <sighs> to be honest, I don't know how to feel about these revelations that keep getting dumped on us in a few lines uh, of dialogue. Hoseki no Kimi is generally a pretty fast-paced story, but these last few chapters, we have just gone at like warp speed. I I totally get the possible the plausibility actually of making the transformation machine work and then suddenly discovering the memories that had floated away submerged in the ice on some moon. I just wish that we'd seen more development of those things because they're like pretty critical plot points. It also just felt really abrupt the quickness with which Yuke and all the other gems accepted becoming Lunarians. You know, there's no um, obvious internal struggle at all. Like, we don't get to see it, at least. We only saw that uh, one conversation between Amethyst and Yuke, and then the decision was made because supposedly everyone just wants to, to stop fighting. And I can see how they got there. Like, of course, everyone's tired of the war. Even Vought just wants to go back to the jellyfish, you know. But what happened to, say, um, Bort's line of thinking, you know, where they belittled Foss for trusting the Lunarians and basically how all the other gems shat on Foss for siding with the Lunarians. But now, you know, they've all become Lunarian themselves without so much as a blink. So basically, I have no problem with the conclusion that was reached. It just feels like we took a major narrative shortcut at the expense of a jarring inconsistency with how the Earth Gems have reacted to Lunarians before. Um, and as so you've all learnt, we should never ever take shortcuts. The last thing I want to say about these chapters um, is, okay, so Ikmi has made Foss into a god for everyone, who after 10,000 years will then send them all into nothingness, ending that eternal cycle of suffering. It is strange though, because we were never shown whether the gems, like moon or earth gems, actually want to go into nothingness. And if they do, it's not clear that they know what going into nothingness actually means. Like, for example, Cairngorm, remember? Like, they thought that they would be going into nothingness because they wanted to be with Ikmia. But they didn't even get that. There will be no Ikmia. There will be no them. There will be no relationship. It's, it's nothing, you know? Um, so... I just suspect that maybe that's the same sort of mindset for all the gems. You know, yes, they all accepted becoming Lunarians, but even the reasons the moon gems gave for wanting to become Lunarians all had to do with how they didn't want to deal with having a physical body anymore. Like, they just rather be able to fly around everywhere, which is more convenient, probably more environmentally friendly, you know. <laughs> and we've heard even less from the Earth gems who woke up after being smashed by the moon gems and Orphos 
and presumably know nothing about this business of eventually becoming nothing. <laughs> you know, because as I said before, like becoming nothing means there will be no flying around. Like there's no restaurant for Alex. There's no idol life for Daya. There's no more um, knowledge seeking for Amethyst. Um, you know, because nothing is nothing. Like I find it hard to believe that the gems are at that stage of letting all these things go. And it feels like we're meant to assume that everyone's just wholesale accepted this idea that being prayed for and going into nothingness is the best thing for them, that no one wants to enjoy life forever. However, it's not being made explicit or implicit in the text that that is actually <laughs> what they think. All of this is just, Ikmia is the one that has been making the decision for everyone, you know? So in sum, it's strange to me um, how quickly everyone has become Lunarians and just chosen to live under Ikmia's command, like all compliant and just waiting for Foss to complete their 10,000 years. And unless like future chapters go back and address this, um, I guess we're also just to assume that everyone is either okay with or completely oblivious to the fact that they sacrificed Foss's free will and mental well-being to get to this point. Given how quickly we're blowing past these crucial plot points, it does feel like Ichikawa just wants to get Hoseki no Kuni over and done with, and I can't even blame her for that, if that's true. You know, for a story with like 20 odd key characters, each with their individual struggles and backstory, you know, backstories that are thick as butter and then contain so much symbolism, you know, it would have taken, I think, double the number of volumes to have dealt with everything adequately. And so that's why I'm feeling pretty forgiving of how, like, especially in the last volume or two, there's been these huge plot holes that have been plugged up quite haphazardly. Um, and at the same time, you know, I just had to point them out. And I guess I'm curious if you feel the same way or if I'm just missing something and, and some of these plot points sort of have been addressed in the past. Um, last but not least, uh, Antark, Antark, Antark. Uh, we finally got Antark back, uh, but as a Lunarian now, which feels a little bit wrong, to be honest. Um, you know, that does weird things to my mind. And what kills me is that the first thing they think of is <laughs> they remember their last words to Foss about making sure Congo isn't lonely. Those words have also come true in a way. You know, Foss did end up relieving Congo of his duties um, as an eternally lonely higher power by taking his place and allowing him to ascend to the moon along with all the other gems. So those are my thoughts on the last chapters. Um, and even though the story is not done yet, you know, it definitely feels like we've reached the end of a major arc, that of Foss finally becoming fully human and then set on this path now towards becoming a fully fledged god, which means it's now time for me to attempt to capture and express my overall feelings about Hoseki no Kuni as a whole without taking 10,000 years to do it. And given the immensity and the depth of plot that we've covered to this point, I won't be able to cover everything, but I will do my best. And um, you know what? You guys have always been there to pick up the slack and just shown up with really interesting takes, which I'm always so grateful for. Uh, so yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and as usual, I'll be hanging out on Discord and Twitter and, you know, YouTube comment section after I post this. So at a really high level, uh, Hoseki no Kuni will always have a special place in my heart and in my mind. Like, I know I'm still at a very, very early stage of discovering new anime and manga, but... Hoseki was like the first anime, not that I watched, but the first one that I really sat down to analyze and dig deeper into its themes and characters and uh, philosophy. And I was able to do that in large part because of you in the Hoseki no Kuni fandom who somehow found your way to my channel and was so generous with your knowledge and so tolerant of my like crappy, awkward video making skills that I was so struck. I was like, wow, not only is this 
story itself unlike anything I've seen before, but the fans are pretty awesome as well. Putting aside like that sentimental value that I place on Hoseki no Kuni, um, taken on its own as a literary and art piece, I feel Hoseki no Kuni is in a category all on its own. Um, and I don't say that lightly. I have been a huge like fantasy fan since I was little. You know, I was that nerd at school giving up my lunch hours to head to the library to read like all the fantasy books and then I would just go straight home to play I don't know what was it back there like Elder Scrolls you know and having consumed like a fair bit of fantasy over the years you see these common through lines that run through almost every series you know there are big differences within those commonalities but at the end of the day you know those genre tropes permeate like 95% of all fantasy media, you know, which is completely fine. Like that is what makes fantasy fantasy. Uh, for example, like there's usually an identifiable magic system or some kind of elemental system. There's almost always an evil power that needs defeating and a side that is good if flawed. Or there are like multiple factions, each with their own political identity or culture and cultural markers who clash in pursuit of their own interests. Um, there are also like these identifiable, you know, lanes within fantasy, you know, like medieval fantasy or tribal, post-apocalyptic, um, steampunk, and then there's gangland fantasy. Um, so it's quite varied, but also quite um, defined. But what impressed me so much with Hoseki is just how original and outside of these typical fantasy tropes it was. And if it did make use of a fantasy trope, it did so in a really fresh way. Um, so much so that I can't really compare it to any other series that I've watched or read. Like really cool and original concepts include how the characters and their personalities are directly tied to actual real world gemology. Like the idea of inclusions and its connection to questions of memory and then consequently identity. Uh, I also like appreciate that a lot of the tension starts and simmers beneath what is a pretty a mundane, domestic almost setting, even though it is fantastical. Like here we have a family of immortal gems, each with their own colourful personalities, uh, probably except for Benito, <laughs> who get into like all sorts of family squabbles. And you know, it was the humour of how the gems interacted with each other was a huge part of what made Hoseki so enjoyable. Particularly, I really loved when Rutil would give shit to Foss. Like, that was my favourite. Those, those parts were my favourite. Um, and what elevated that was that bubbling beneath the surface of all those interactions, those domestic type interactions, were all of these identity crises and all the relationship problems that would eventually lead to bigger and more serious conflict. Um, even with the Lunarians, like once we got to know their personalities and the stories behind the faceless attackers, it turned out that the reason they were doing all these terrible things and, and waging war was because they were bored. Like they were listless, they had nowhere else left to progress their society and their careers. And so to me, that is something else that makes Hoseki no Kuni so different. Like that all underlying conf conflict in Hoseki can be traced back to um, not to grand and conflicting political visions or like a titanic struggle between good and evil, but to immortals struggling with ennui, like struggling with the mundanity of life, with the weariness of flawed relationships. You know, things that your average human being knows all too well. And so um, because that is what is driving the conflict between the Lunarians, the Lustrous and the Admirabilis, I felt like we got the best of both worlds in Hoseki no Kini. You know, we got slice of life type interactions and we got the epic fights and the dramatic scenes typical of, of most fantasy stories. You know, usually you get 
either one or the other, but Ishikawa did a great job of just marrying those two different aspects. Um, for example, like, you know, the details of what each gem likes and doesn't like, like their individual ticks were done so well and they're so fine grained. Like, did we really need that, um, hilarious conversation that I still remember, like between, it was Retail Foss and Red Beryl about like the philosophy of fashion. Like, no, we didn't need it, but it served to highlight the different personalities and how they play off each other or are just playfully condescending towards each other. Or in Retail's case, it's probably actual condescending. <laughs> um, did we need to know about Bo's long obsession with jellyfish? Actually, yes, I'm going to say that that was a critical need to know. Um, but, you know, same goes with the, like, the family dinner scene on the moon, you know, Barbada accepting bribes to pursue his pasta research. And then Alex, which is, again, another one of my favorite parts, Alex discovering their passion for being a chef. Like, all the little funny everyday gem life snapshots at the end of each volume as well. The attention paid to mundane details matters. Like, they really flesh out the characters without Ichikawa directly telling us what motivates and what drives them. So that when, um, you know, the shit really hit the fan, we're doubly invested in the outcomes and the emotion behind the choices that are made or the relationships that are lost because it's like we know them as we would know friends. The other standout of Hoseki was the integration of Buddhist symbolism and how key Buddhist anecdotes like the treasure tower are seated in the story and in Foss's gradual transformation. And if you research the beliefs and the symbolism uh, represented in the story, you can have a lot of fun predicting, um, as I did, like what will happen next. Like everything from the clothes that Nikomio chose to wear to the popping up everywhere of, of lotus blossoms, it all meant something. Uh, and sometimes that symbolism was deliberately twisted. So for example, that um, giant gem clamp we see in volume three that messes up Amethyst. Um, there was like a chain with a lotus bloom hanging off it and it was jarring to see that symbol of peace and enlightenment attached to a new terrifying weapon and used to enact violence. You know, even at the very beginning, like I remember being intrigued by um, how the Lenarian army takes the form of these Buddhas or Bodhisattvas because growing up on like a diet of Hong Kong TV series set in the ancient fantasy world, those were always the incorruptible good guys who kept the peace and would never wage war. You know, so this twisting of the symbolism uh, reflects Foss's journey too. Like, their path towards enlightenment ended up twisting them into this mindless entity bent solely on revenge. And what's really interesting is that enlightenment is ultimately... Uh, like a forsaking of earthly relationships and desires. It's like a goal that you actively work towards yourself. It's always a choice. But while Foss did achieve like enlightenment in the sense of forsaking everything and burning all their bridges, they got there in a way that leaves you feeling real uncomfortable and just asking, but at what cost? You know, just feeling bad that they had little to no choice in the matter of becoming human. All right, so let's go through now the key characters of Hoseki no Kuni. Um, I love this cast and I am going to miss them. Uh, on the bright side, though, is that we do get a break from having to watch them suffer endlessly. And that applies, of course, the most to Foss. So Foss, Foss. Foss is up there as one of the most complex protagonists that I have ever come across. You know, the epitome of a tragic hero. Their optimism and kindness, their empathy and I guess penchant for honesty and their ambition, all of these positive attributes were twisted and exploited by Ikmian to lead them to their final sacrifice. What made it doubly tragic is that Foss was seen as a traitor and absolutely pilloried for trusting the Lunarians, for even wanting to talk to them, and then in the end, everyone ended up a Lunarian anyway. <laughs> and 
we're not shown again, as I said before, like if any gem reflected on that and was like, damn, maybe we should have listened to Foz like, you know, earlier and a whole lot of pain could have been avoided. You know, so Foz, Foz is a rolling, roiling bundle of complexities. And I love that I get headaches trying to sort out why Foss did what they did um, and whether what was done was freely done versus, you know, done as a result of manipulation and or like unresolved trauma. And, you know, oftentimes it was both. There are three like key things that make me sympathize with Foss a lot, despite the violence and the insanity that they're driven to in later parts of the story. And we really have to give Ichiko props for that. It is not easy to write the downfall or the descent into madness of your main protagonist in a way that doesn't come off as ill-considered or done purely for shock value. Um, and actually very, very few series that I've seen who went that route did it successfully. Like most just made me want to throw my book or my laptop out the window. So, you know, the first thing that made Foss really easy to sympathize with is that they were conditioned from birth by all the other gens to think that they were useless. And this inferiority complex grows worse over time and the more tragedies are inflicted on Foz. You know, courtesy of Ikmir's grand plan, you know, to turn them into a pseudo-human. Think back to Foss, you know, considering hacking their own arms off, you know, after Antuck just casually comments about wishing how their arms would match the strength of their agate legs. You know, so not only does Foss have to deal with this um, debilitating sense of being useless, but this lack of self-worth feeds into and also grows their guilt. If there was a like nutshell summary of Foss's guilt that they carried with them all the way to the end, it would be what they screamed out as they watched Antark be taken away. You know, they were at a loss as to why, despite gaining these powerful legs and trying so hard, why Antark just kept getting further and further away. Like, to Foss, everything they did only made things worse. Um, a belief that only reinforced what the other gens had told them since birth. And so every time they came out of a fight with the Lunarians worse for wear or put other gens in danger, that guilt grew and that guilt was like a huge part of why Foss pushed themselves so hard to seek the truth to fight for a better life for the lustrous you know at least initially like what made that guilt worse um was you know just this proper lack of mental health care and we talked a lot about that in earlier reactions how all the gems suffered from a lack of guidance on how to deal with their personal demons um, like Congo's approach to trauma, because he didn't know better, I guess, was to just let things play out, you know, and hopefully time will make things better. Um, I mean, after all, time is all they have, you know, they have all the time in the world, you know, as immortals. So remember um, Perido and Sphine's story about asking Congo for wisdom on dealing with the guilt of slowly forgetting their lost partners, his advice was to just let their emotions run their natural course. And then one day, even though it might take a very long time, a final resolution would just pop out, like out of the blue, <laughs> which, you know, it's possible. That's not wrong, but this let it be approach doesn't pan out well, you know, especially if the gem in question has an extremely heavy guilt complex. Like, remember how scary, um, happy clown Foss was? That is what happens when you just let things be, you know, and you bury your questions and your insecurities and your guilt deep, deep, deep down until they just, like, eat you alive. The second reason why I um, sympathize with Foss is that a lot of their actions can be attributed to the huge changes in personality and identity caused by like the loss of most of their physical parts and their inclusions um, as well as like the volatility of being pieced together with a dozen or so different materials and I loved how as the story progressed um, we were constantly faced with that question of is Foss still Foss especially after the crazy Laffer's head swap you know Lapis's intelligence and keen eye for detail and their own um, suspicions of Congo really pushed Foss further down the path towards conflict. 
given all the trauma that Foss went through and how often they deployed their gold alloy, you know, Foss has to be given credit. You know, they did one hell of a job clinging on to their old self for as long as they did. Um, you know, were it not for their freakishly strong inclusions, I think Foss would have been lost a long, long time ago. And even Ikmia acknowledges that. Like, he was like, even after the the agate legs and the gold arms, you know, they were still, you know, their own self and they weren't desperate enough yet. So, you know, it just, it makes me sad to remember there was a time when uh, it was Foss looking out the window at Zircon chasing Bort with a comb and just smiling sadly because, you know, at that point, deep down, Foss wanted to live, well, to keep living that happy family life. They were changing and becoming more melancholy and definitely more guilt-ridden, but still had enough of their original selves to want that relationship with the Lustrous, you know, until they didn't. It was also fascinating to see the way that Foss's goals and desires changed as they went through their physical and mental metamorphosis. Like they went from um, wanting to be useful, to wanting the truth, to wanting to end the war and restore the lost gems, to just thirsting for pure revenge. Um, But then I guess they sort of backpedaled a bit, like at the end after breaking Congo, Foss did have enough presence of mind to walk back through the school, seemingly wanting to now put the others back together now that their job was done. And it was like they'd done like a 360, you know, after eviscerating the lustrous, they somehow went back to caring about them, at least in some capacity. Um, And, you know, one thing that was always there from the beginning, though, um, and therefore can't be attributed to any physical changes and which I felt contributed to Foss ending where they did was their ambition. For starters, like their ambition painted a giant red target on their back. You know, um, Ikmia basically said that Foss's ambition was too big for how weak their body was. And so that's why they made a perfect candidate for turning into a pseudo-human because Ikmia needed a gem who would be more likely or more desperate to seek out ways to improve themselves or their station in life and just willingly go through these drastic changes in order to do so. Um, And of course, like a lot of things outside of Ikemia's control needed to fall into place for that plan to work. Like one of those was the other gems like Antark and Padaba and Ghost in their own ways, all encouraging Foss to develop their sense of self and confidence. It's like, um, what's that saying? Like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a you can't make a drink, right? So, the key ingredient that made those circumstances work in Ikemia's favor was Foss's ambition to make something of themselves. So, I guess like Foss's story is a fascinating study, or I guess like a warning into how ambition is a real double-edged sword. Like depending on how you apply it, it can either set you up for life really well, or it can turn the world against you. The last point that made me sympathize with Foss is that they started out kind. Um, A lot of what they did was for the sake of the lustrous and for ending the war. Um, And what makes Foss so fascinating is how like running parallel to their sometimes self-serving ambition was also genuine care and love. Like the first time Foss planned to go to the moon, they were fully prepared to get smashed into pieces for the sake of the truth. You know, they were devastated when they found out what the sand on the moon actually was. And they also broke emotionally when Ikmia informed them that they wouldn't be able to restore the ground up gems below a hardness of four, um, which included Antark. Um, also, you know, there's things like Foss taking the time to worry about the moon gems, getting stuck, like should Congo pray and then all the Lunarians leave. So I think there are all these signs of Foss's love for the other gems and signs that made it clear that that care was genuine, you know, until all of that care and love got completely squeezed out of them by their worsening mental state and their desire for revenge, you know, and also just the rapid loss of their original inclusions. 
Foss was also way ahead of everyone else in terms of considering the possibility that maybe the Lenarians aren't enemies or they don't have to be. Like when Ventricosis first spoke of the origin myth, Foss comments that if the story is true, then they shouldn't have to fight because they're one people, right? They all came from humans. You could almost call Foss a prophet. <laughs> like, because here we are at the end of chapter 95, and they are all one people now, you know, except for the Admirables, but, you know, that's by the by. Um, so Foss totally called it, or at least had that open-mindedness to envision a united future, and they were right, but they were right too early. Um, and speaking of Ventricosis, you know, Foss is also kind to the Admirables, um, and, you know, I think OG Foss would have fought hard for the Admirables to be included in on Ichmian's plan to save them all. Um, unlike the other gems who considered Admirables, like, inferior, almost, like, dirty life forms, you know, unlike them, Foss treated the Admir Admirables pretty much on equal footing. Um, they forgave Ventricosis for their betrayal, they struck up this really good rapport with Varagatus, and then they refused to commit genocide, you know, on the Admirables for the sake of restoring uh, the gems. Although that last point is probably a real low bar because <laughs> you should never ever consider committing, you know, genocide on any race. Okay, but having said all that, you know, there's no doubt that Foss has some serious personality flaws and made choices that escalated conflict when they had other options. So the first major flaw, like, related to their ambition is that sometimes, especially after losing more parts of themselves, it was hard to tell if Foss was doing things altruistically, like for the sake of others, or whether their primary motivation was just to prove that they could do it and do it on their own. Um, and we saw that really clearly when Foss visited the gem reconstruction facility and sees the progress that Barbada has made. And their first reaction isn't, um, oh, that's great, you know, soon we'll be able to restore um, everyone that we've lost. It was, see, I don't need anybody. You know, I'm doing all the right things on my own. But even before then, when, for example, they tried to convince Cinnabar to go with them to the moon, the way that Foss framed their arguments, telling Cinnabar that the Lunarians could help get rid of their Mercury, and then the way that they lost their temper, that dialogue definitely revealed Foss's um, growing skills of manipulation and that behind their, you know, seemingly noble goals that they too had their own selfish reasons for wanting to do things. So the fact that both altruism and selfish ambition were at play um, made Foss such a fascinating character to try and understand, especially when Foss had to do something shady for like the greater cause of, of uncovering the truth or of getting Congo to pray. Um, case in point, like when Ghost jumped onto the Lunarian transport that's rolled up into a ball, uh, Foss instinctively rushed to save Ghost, but then stopped just to wait and see what Congo would do as bait. Like using a fellow gem's well-being like that was definitely not cool. Also not cool was how Foss, Foss, Foss would force Kangon to do things against their own will or how they enticed the earth gems to go to the moon with them by withholding parts of the truth. One last um, pretty massive miscalculation or mistake that I think Foss did that could have avo avoided like a whole world of pain and conflict was that Foss was too quick to dismiss the possibility of asking Congo further questions about humans. Um, and the Lunarians, by extension. Um, yes, he was being weirdly compliant, which made Foss think that he was being condescending or even mocking them. Um, and arguably, that was Lapis's suspicions at work influencing Foss. But also, I remember Goshen hammering the nail right on the head when, after Foss said that they'd wished they asked Congo more questions, Goshen jumps in and goes, well, are you sure it's not just because you feel guilty? And that was a sick burn because it was so true. Like, I think some part of Foss felt guilty for, in a way, planning a revolt almost right under his nose and using deception and rhetoric manipulation to do it. 
Um, and so Foss probably didn't want to confront him about the truth because they'd have to show their own hand as well. By the time like Foss is raining down spikes on the moon gems and threatening to grind up any gem who gets in their way, it's clear that any altruism in them has gone. Like they even scoff at Amethyst's continued work on restoring the gems. You know, and after 220 years of being split apart and buried, you know, Foss is obsessed only with making Congo pray and destroying anyone who gets in the way. So there aren't even factions anymore for them. There's no Lunarian nor Earth or Moon Gem. It's them versus anyone who won't do what they say. Um, and given that Foss's transformation was in large part orchestrated by Ikmia, the difficult question is... How much can you really blame Foss for, in the end, bringing the entire Lunarian army down to smash the Earth Gems? Like, how can you condemn someone who seemingly no longer has any capacity for self-control? The saddest thing about Foss becoming the next prayer being is the words that Congo spoke to the game pieces. Those are now being revisited on Foss. So the words were... We never thought about what would happen to the things we created when they reached their end, did we? So assuming that Foss prays for everyone after the 10,000 years being alone, and also assuming that unlike Congo, they stay sane and unbroken long enough to do that, like what happens to Foss next? You know, what if they can't self-destruct? Um, they will be left on Earth just like Congo was. Like no one is thinking about Foss's end and their predicament once uh, they fulfill their divine purpose, you know. Um, well, Ikemi, I think, has definitely thought about it, but it's treated as a non-issue. And since we mentioned Congo, like, let's talk about our beloved sensei. <laughs> like, how far are we from the beginning, you know, when Congo started out as this absolute authority figure, then was revealed to be a prayer machine, to now being turned into your regular Joe, like, Lunarian. <laughs> the... The development and the length of that arc is one of my favorite parts of Hoseki because I, I was always caught by surprise. The The greatest casualty of the story to me was the relationship between Congo and Foss. Like long, long, long ago in a deep dark corner of Foss's memories and our memories, like Foss just wanted to fight Lunarians because they loved Congo, you know, and Congo too also cared for Foss. Like they characterized Foss as being this kind and gentle gem and, and gave them lots of head pats. Remember the depth to which Congo cared for his kids as well, like including Foss. I still think like the most touching part in all these volumes was probably when Congo retold the story of how he found the first gem, Red Dyer, and how he taught them everything, as well as how Red Dyer came to really love and respect Congo. And so much so that the reason why they all put white powder on themselves now is because um, Red Dyer did that first because they wanted to look like Congo. You know, also, like, I still remember Congo getting very angry or very emotional every time a gem put themselves in danger. Like, Morgra and Goshen in Volume 1, literally in the first few panels. Um, also, when he heard that uh, Foss had gone into the ocean at great risk to themselves or, you know, had been taken to the moon, he broke things, man. <laughs> so his um, malfunction, that of caring for the gems too much, um, was very apparent from the very beginning. Um, however, in relation to Foss, like that all changes when Foss becomes human enough to command Congo to do things. The fact that um, Congo couldn't pray for Foss due to what Ikmia called like a breakdown of the interior, even though he wanted to, was tragic in that it was a factor and neither of them were in control of, you know, and it ended up pushing Foss further and further into their angry insanity to the point where Foss wanted Congo to end their life. And when he couldn't, Foss broke him, which of course was Ikmia's plan all along. Also, like the more parts that Foss lost of themselves and the more others treated them like the enemy, the more that idea of making Congo pray became untethered from any greater purpose, you know, including Foss's original plan to, you know, pave a way for peace between the Lustrous and the Lunarians. Which brings me to another point that I'm still pondering about with Congo is that couldn't he have told Foss the truth about humans and his role as a prayer machine sooner? 
Like, definitely before Foss felt the need to convince the gems to leave him for the moon. Because, like, when Congo finally came clean to the remaining Earth gems, uh, the words are bleeped out of his explanation, but it's clearly enough to give the gems a general gist of what's happening. You know, enough for them to figure out that Congo is a machine, that the Lenarians attack because they want to make him prey, um, and also enough for them to want to, like, remake their relationship um, and have, you know, society based on truth and equality and tackling the problem together. So, like, I mean, if only he had said those things to Foss too, like, I honestly think it would have changed everything. You know, part of that is Foss's fault too, like I mentioned before, but also part of it is how um, passive Congo is as a character. You know, it's like it took losing a third of his kids to the moon and seeing how damaged the rest of his kids were to shake him out of his stupor and actually, you know, try to convey some sort of explanation that would explain things so much better. Ironically, like for all the times Congo told Foss to be satisfied with their place or their purpose in life, he of all people knew what it was like to have been created with an inner purpose but be unable to fulfill it. Um, in much the same way I think Foss was born with the sense that they should be doing great things but had a body that was unable to back that ambition up. And so all those parallels with Congo, like particularly the last part of Foss taking over his role as the divine power I think they further prove, you know, Ishikawa's genius at building a story around characters with such rich internal emotional backstories. Um, and I guess last thing about Congo is, did we ever solve the mystery of why he is so sleepy all the time? Um, it was alluded to like several times throughout the volumes and I don't even know if it goes beyond like the humor, you know, of Jade breaking their limbs trying to wake Congo up. Okay, Ikmia, like the prince, the one who very appropriately has a clear connection to Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, so just like Machiavelli's ideal ruler, like Ikmia is not malicious for no reason. Rather, I think he acts um, with the good of his people and his city in mind, and if securing their future and well-being requires carrying out morally questionable acts, then so be it. Um, and I actually I like that he owns up to having done crimes against humanity. So, I mean, while I do have several sins to lay at Ikmir's feet, I also want to emphasize and make clear that Ikmir's actions up until this point have made total logical sense to me, even more so than Foss. Um, like, I admire his foresight and his uncanny ability to move others around like set pieces on a chessboard to get done what he thinks needs doing. There was a time when I thought that Ikmir was the Lunarian equivalent of Foss in some important ways. Like, they were both trying to do better for their people, they both felt alone amongst their own kind. Ikmir, because the other Lunarians don't understand why he just won't enjoy life on the moon if there's nothing they can do about it. And Foss, who was burdened with, um, you know, Congo's secrets and of ending the war. However, things change when the gems arrive on the moon. The Lustrous, by, I guess, presenting new challenges and starting new relationships, give the Lunarians a new lease on life. And Ikmir himself discovers new reasons for wanting to continue to exist, unlike Foss, who becomes increasingly isolated from the Lustrous. Um, I mean, Ikmir even found, like, a family, almost, with, with Kangorm, first and foremost, and then with Barbeda and the others. And he eventually even became okay with being called a name. <laughs> like, remember how he, much he hated it at the beginning? So I think his arc is just as traumatic as Congo's. Like, he went from painstakingly making Foss into a pseudo-human with the singular goal of becoming nothing because he was just so tired of living to now pivoting to plan B, which was to unite the Lustrous and the Lunarians and usher in this new 10,000 year era. Um, and as a side note, like the number 10,000, um, I don't know about other usages, but in Imperial China, when Empress took court, uh, their subjects would pay respect to them by shouting out what literally translates into as 10,000 years, like 10,000 years, like one sui, one sui. You know, like essentially wishing the emperor a long life of 10,000 years, which really meant like forever. So that's why I don't think the time length of 10,000 years was randomly chosen. Um, 
because it also lends a bit of irony to the situation, like given Ichmir's original vendetta against living forever, and yet he's just pronounced like a new 10,000 year golden age, you know, um, and, you know, is at the start of implementing his dream of giving his and Kangum's child, like, I mean, theoretical child, metaphorical, physical child, I'm not really sure, but nonetheless, their child, a future where there is no more division between the three races. Um, yeah, so that word, like, future, that always confused me about the Lunarians. Like, when we first met them, they understandably wanted nothing more than to go into nothingness. But once life picked up on the moon, they still continued to work on having Foss uh, make Congo prey, which I thought was weird because once... Because I, I thought, like, once life was actually enjoyable and meaningful again, that they'd not want to be sent into nothingness. Um, but I guess, like, the Lunarians know, maybe, that eventually the good times will run out because they've been through it before. And they know that by even by the end of this new 2000, uh, not 2000, 10,000 years, that they have to wait for Foss that by the end of that, they'll be ready to go into nothingness, you know. And the gems too. It's like you can only outrun the mundanity of eternity for so long. Um, and that, like, randomly makes me think about humans' historical quest for immortality, you know, from ancient times all the way to today's, like, anti-Asians and, like, biohackers all aiming for radical life extension. I think... Hoseki, you know, at a grander scale, poses these interesting um, philosophical, like, stop you in your tracks sort of questions that should make humans rethink our assumptions about longevity being an inherently good thing. All right, so I said that I hold Ikmi responsible for quite a, a list of sins, so here we go. Um, first, his manipulation of Foss, and to a certain extent, the other gems, was reprehensible. <laughs> and I know exactly why he had to do it. I even agree with and I admire the pragmatism in pretty much all of his choices. But that doesn't make them, like, those choices morally okay. Um, also, I really love Foss, and so I am obligated to take up this legal case. Um... So it wasn't just not telling Foss that Congo would never pray again and thus setting up that final explosive, um, angry command for Congo to break. It was Ikmia not telling Foss that after they got um, the pearl eye that Congo would become more submissive due to that additional part of humanity in them. But because Foss didn't know that, like this changed behaviour made Foss more suspicious of Congo and Foss even thought he was mocking them. Um, also, when Foss was worrying about how the moon gems might be stuck in the moon after Congo prays and the Lunarians disappear, Ikmia walked Foss through all the plans they had in place to ensure that the gems could leave the moon, when really it wouldn't even matter, because all the gems would have gone into nothingness with the Lunarians. Um, like, clearly Ikmia worried that Foss knowing everyone would disappear, not just the Lunarians, would put a huge damper on their desire to make Congo pray. Because at that stage, Foss hadn't descended far enough down into madness um, to not care for the other gems. You know, they obviously still very much cared, and Ikmia couldn't allow them to know that for that very reason. Other shitty things that Ikmia did, like directing Cicada and by extension Kangom, even though they weren't meant to be there, to stop Foss from reconciling with the gems if it looked like they were. Like remember Padba, they saw right through to that like, to that play, you know? Um, the way that Ikmia planted doubts about Congo in the minds of the moon gems, all of that unsubstantiated talk, to me at least, about Congo's armor of love, like how it makes gems instinctively protect Congo in pairs, even though it puts themselves at risk. But later, like when we see how the earth gems protect Congo, they don't follow that formation anymore. They just did what worked best for the situation at hand. You know, there was also all that bull crap about Congo giving the gems their freedom because he wants the gems to be more like his former human masters. Um, 
Ikmi also constantly emphasized how Congo is a machine made by humans, subject to human programming, which is true, but that is an incomplete view of who Congo became after he came to love the gems. But Foss, you know, Foss just ate Ikmi's words all up, probably because they themselves were already inclined to see Congo in that detached, machine-like um, way, um, with like you know selfish ulterior motives lurking behind his every move. In sum, um, Ikmia didn't just use deception to achieve his goals or to get others to unknowingly carry out his secret plans. Um, he was also a master of omission. Like. And again, I, I totally get it. You know, Ikmir had to spin this elaborate web of, of secrecy and, dare I say it, some lies for the purpose of ensuring Foss would arrive at the mental breakdown he needed them to get to. Um, so, like, he had to nurture and direct Foss's hatred and tiredness at Congo for the sake of the Lenarians, his people. There are um, other things that Ikmia may or may not have done that are less explicit and you kind of have to piece vague bits together and read between the lines to surmise that Ikmia has done a lot more to mess Foss up than even the things that we've already talked about. Like for example, um, remember on the moon only Padpa could keep Foss in check and keep their emotions in control. Um, we also mentioned before how Padba was the only gem who could see through the machinations of the Lunarian's manipulation at work. And that is probably why Ikmia hid Padpa away after that first failed attack in that secret facility that no other gem knew about until Goshen randomly stumbled across it. Because he needed, I guess, Foss not to come to their senses. You know, there's no reason, like, if Goshen could repair Padba with a push of the button, that Padba had to be kept away from the moon gems for so long. Um, there's also the matter of the hallucinations, you know, Foss had of all the gems telling them those awful things about them and that they'd never actually said. And we talked about it, I think, a few reactions back, but yeah, the way um, Ikmia instructed Barbada to be careful with Foss's memories of the 200 years they were buried on Earth, um, that still reads as super sus. And in the context of his needing to stoke Foss's anger and desperation, that would seem totally in line with his grand plan. Final thing I'll say about Ikmia, um, I think he took a bit too much credit for successfully turning Foss into a human uh, and then a god. Like, yes, he provided the materials and the opportunities for Foss and definitely made it more likely Foss would take on the different pieces of the three races, but there was also a pretty massive amount of luck and chance involved. Things like, um, I think it was Aculiatus, you know, being willing to gift Foss with agate legs, um, like Antark coming across the gold alloy and deciding to try it out on Foss, um, all the things that Padpa, Cinnabar, Ghost, and Kangum and Lapis did to help Foss, you know, um, grow into themselves and develop their sense of volition. And also, it relied a lot on Foss not questioning Congo anymore. You know, all of these things... I feel we're outside of Ikima's control and actually I think it's more exciting to think how all of those chance happenings came together to put Foss on this warpath. Um, like the volatility of all the factors and the uncertainty of the final outcome I think is a far more interesting perspective than if we were to retcon everything and just reduce it down to, well, it all happened because Ikmia made it happen. <sighs> Which brings me to my final take on the gems. In my mind, the interactions between the gems is where the real chemistry happened. <laughs> and um, like where Ichikawa's writing really shone in terms of developing out the characters of this very large cast of gems and all their crisscrossing relationships between them. Um, and in each gem and each pair of gems was embodied some very human flaws. Like a lot of the angst or the agony in Hoseki no Kuni um, can be traced back to like a failure to communicate or to deal with relational issues openly and in constructive ways. So those breakdowns in communication and the insecurities that they led to also provided Foss with 
open doors, like to entice the gems to leave Congo and to cause that rift between the earth and the moon gems. Um, even in volume one, where you get the most like lighthearted moments, when the gems were just bagging each other out or, you know, playing cards or dress up, you could already sense like the fracture lines running beneath this shiny veneer of the gems living this idyllic immortal life. You know, um, I have to say though that what was heartening was that even after the rift between the moon and earth gems, except for gems like Dyer, who we'll talk about later, Mostly they had no grudges against each other on both sides, you know, they would have been happy to live out their respective lives, maybe reminisce a little about their former partners, but, you know, of course, with the existence of Foss, you know, and with Ikmia needing to get Congo broke, that wasn't gonna last. And okay, speaking of immortality, like, I've not seen a piece of fantasy media that portrays the anguish of immortality in such relatable terms. Um, like, I remember that quote from the quack doctor, you know, um, that even if they're grounded to powder or sunk to the bottom of the sea, it's no more than a temporary death for them. But then, of course, being immortal also makes the gems incapable of ever giving up on anything. Um, so at the end of these 95 chapters, it's clear that to immortal gem beings, having a purpose they can actually realize is their salvation. You know, the gems who are most secure in their purpose and their self-identity, or whose purpose for being didn't depend solely on another gem's actions or opinions, came out the most unbroken. Um, and in the end, I think it was Jade, Yuke, and Bort, who came out the strongest in that department. There is no question that as a group, the Lustrous treated Foss pretty badly. Like when Foss was born, they were so dismissive of them. They're also complacent in a lot of ways. Like when Foss is dropped off back to Earth the first time, they're curious, but then immediately go on with their lives, you know, and they actually believe Foss to be completely fine now when Foss switches on happy clown Foss, you know, and I think being immortal skews or reduces the seriousness with which gems um, take, like, mental breakdowns and dealing with the aftermath of trauma. You know, there was that conversation between Yuk and Rutil where Yuk says to um, Rutil, like, you know, maybe we're not as smart as we look, you know, we can't sense danger like the insects. And do we have our immortality to blame for that? And then Rutil, who is at that time still relatively sane, replies with, it's thanks to our immortality that we don't have to be scared of a little change. So we don't have to be scared of a little change. Essentially, Rutil is repeating Congo's advice. Like, because gems have all the time in the world to sort out their issues. You just gotta let things be, you know. Time will heal all wounds and and change will just will just be, you know. <laughs> Eventually you'll get used to it. Which, as we see with pretty much all the gems, turns out to not be true. Like, in fact, having all the time in the world comes with its own set of burdens and other kinds of long-term damage the gems didn't really discover in themselves until Foss shook things up. Even the moon gems are lukewarm towards Foss, like despite all of Foss's efforts to end the war. You know, and after they learn from Ikmia that Foss was slashed to bits by eight flying katanas, the moon gems are like surprised and a little bit sad, but really not too sad. Um, you know, they got extremely comfortable on the moon and were content to just forget about Earth. Um, and, you know, you can't really blame them because life on the moon was pretty sweet, you know. Um, in a way, they also kind of, like, gave up on Foss because they didn't push for Ikmia to collect Foss right away um, and ended up, you know, passing a very happy 220 years without Foss. And they never would have retrieved Foss, you know, had it not been for Padpa and Goshen going on a little, like, unauthorized <laughs> rescue mission. Um, and I guess even the gems who were kind to Foss, um, those gems 
coddled Foss, which also wasn't great for their sense of self-worth. Like, for example, when Antark didn't allow Foss to take any responsibility for themselves when they lost their arms to the ice flows, um, it wasn't their intention, but that clearly made Foss feel even more useless than they already did. Um, also, back in the day when Dyer was still nice, like their solution was just for Foss to um, become something or someone else entirely. Again, not very helpful and proved to be like an awful foreshadowing of what was to come. Um, yeah, so with all of that, like peak isolation for Foss happened at the point where they suddenly felt neither lustrous enough nor Linarian enough. And now at like chapter 95, like Foss is well and truly alone in every possible way while everyone else has been reunited and, you know, united as well with their ancient enemies the Lunarians. all right so final thoughts on each individual main gems or like gem pairs and like again i would love to hear your takes on each or any of the gems because i think everyone will have a really really different opinion like i just spent ages going on and on and on about why i love foss so much but i wouldn't be surprised at all if there were people out there who hate their guts for various reasons um so the first of the gems that i want to talk about who is not Foz, is um, my first gem love, Cinnabar. And they are still my favourite in many ways, although as I said earlier, my image of them has been slightly tarnished. Um, so why do I love Cinnabar? Like, because they're the silent, suffering Ravenclaw of the group, um, highly intelligent and observant, but with a deeply kind heart. Um, they also just want to love and be loved, you know, I still haven't forgotten how heartbreaking it was when Cinnabar wanted to be taken by the Lunarians and just told Foss that they envied them because even the enemy loves them, or at least their mint green colour. So yeah, I started out rooting for Cinnabar so bad, and I still do. Like, you know, their shame over their physical composition, of which they had no control over, led to social ostracization for the first few hundred years of their life. Not because um, the gems actively ostracized Cinnabar, but largely because Cinnabar themselves believed they deserved it. When really, I think their Mercury made them one of the most powerful gems of the group. Um, and in my mind, interestingly, you know, Cinnabar is in many ways very similar to Lapis. Like Lapis, you know, Cinnabar is too clever for their own good, um, but unlike Lapis, they didn't have that um, ambition or drive to satisfy their curiosity at any cost. You know, in fact, it's been mentioned that Cinnabar is often paralyzed by overanalysis. And to continue that parallel, it's interesting that Foss goes from thinking they need Cinnabar to succeed in their mission to miraculously, or rather, like, by Ichmus' design and a bit of luck, um, being gifted with Lapis's head and intelligence. And because Lapis is them, or, like, a part of them, Foss falls into this mindset of, well, well, now I don't need anyone. I've got everything I need now right here with me. Um... So arguably, like, Foss was a perfect match for Lapis's head. You know, their ambition was more on the same wavelength as Lapis's, and it's like Foss's ambition to be great, plus Lapis's intellectual ambition, plus Foss's superinflated ego was the just the perfect, like, toxic combo. I also really miss Cinnabar being Foss's trusted confidant. You know, I loved their camaraderie and their interactions. They were, I felt, the perfect support for each other. And while Cinnabar never actively helped Foss in their search for the truth, they did advise them along the way. Like, for example, cautioning Foss to think through what they'll do if they do find that Congo has done something unforgivable. Um, and actually, I was quite impressed with how even after Foss goes to the moon and comes back, like, they still saw Cinnabar's input and Cinnabar for their part kept Foss's plan secret um, although as I said now I just can't shake the feeling that Cinnabar's need to get in with the other gems eventually led them to actively withhold information about Foss that would have helped the others understand them more um, but you know for all the camaraderie that they did have there were also like moments of jarring disconnect between Cinnabar and Foz um, especially later when Foz tried to convince Cinnabar to go to the moon with them and Foz made the point about well maybe the Lunarians can get rid of your Mercury and that was like a huge misstep on Foz's part like 
One that made them come off like a bit of an asshole, especially when compared to how later the other gems accepted Cinnabar for who they are, like even making them that special mercury-proof hibernation uh, chamber, I guess, so that Cinnabar could hibernate with them. Um, the other marked, like, marked difference between the two was how they received the news that Congo was actually a machine created by humans and not formed naturally over millennia like the lustrous and you know on this like i sided with cinnabar hard because unlike foss who couldn't get out of their heads that congo was fundamentally different um and therefore not deserving to be loved in the same way like cinnabar recognized how lonely congo was and that he was no different really to who he had always been to them you know their teacher who loved them Speaking of um, being cool with Congo being different, um, Antark, you know, still at chapter 95, still the purest and kindest of them all, like knowing Congo was different and then just not caring. Um, so I love Antark. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how they reacted when they first woke up as Lunarian, but I suspect they just took it all in stride as they did for everything, including things like their winter duty, you know, having to be alone for most of the winter with nothing but Congo's hugs to sustain them. I think, you know, that was a pretty harsh existence, but they just shrugged and was like, well, just make do with what we have, right? Um, you know, Antark's impact on Foss's life and their thoughts, especially after they were taken by the Lunarians, cannot be overstated. And so the fact that Foss ended up so against Congo in such contradiction to Antark's last words to them um, is pretty sad. Bort and Dyer. Um, these two are my favorite gem pairing. So the concept of developing an extremely close but fraught relationship based on differences in diamond quality was genius. Uh, I love that detail of Bort being made of an aggregate of tiny crystals with extreme toughness and hardness as opposed to Dyer's more um, fragile single crystal body um, and how that sort of fed into Dyer's feelings of not being a real diamond. Uh, personally, I didn't like Bort much in the beginning, and I didn't make that a secret. Like, I just, I don't respect people who talk down to others, even if they are objectively superior, which Bort is. Um, I also didn't like how when they partnered with Foss, you know, they left Foss to tell Dai about it. You know, Bort definitely knew Dai would be upset, you know, but for the sake of efficiency and training up their newest, you know, star fighter, Bort just sort of went ahead, and that was that. Um, but... You know, as we got to know Bort more, and even though they never really shed their gruff, blunt way of treating others, we really got to see the side of them that just wants everyone to be the best that they can be. And I appreciated how they took Foss and then Zircon and then later Cinnabar under their wing. Um, and by the time that Cinnabar gets to partner up with Bort, like Bort has um, not mellowed mellow is never an appropriate word to use with that gem but as they've just been able to let go of their battle freak side because the need wasn't as urgent anymore you know and so then it's like you see their true character start to shine this considerate but still razor sharp gem just like chilling and taking advantage of peacetime to pursue their passion for jellyfish love hate relationships are the best i mean like story wise <laughs> and the question i've always asked um with born and die is how much of it was love and how much was hate and i think i fall on the side of like more love than hate one, because on Bort's part, you know, when they told Zircon that Yellow was their weakness um, because they're worrying about Yellow all the time, that was a straight up reveal of why they were so protected of Dyer and why they thought that um, ending their partnership was for the best, you know, because they didn't want Dyer getting hurt or, or worse, taken away by the Lunarians. And two, because worrying about that all the time, I think, made their fighting less efficient. Two... Um, because of the saying, like, the opposite of love is in hate, it's actually indifference. And with how much Daya thought about proving to Bort their competence, as well as all that toxic mix of shame and hate and fear that they harbored against Bort, I'm inclined to think that, you know, despite how things ended, that Daya still loved Bort more than hated them. Um, and so with these two, their feelings tended to come, like, rushing out at these super critical super dangerous moments like right 
after Daya defeats Shiro and then also that final confrontation when Daya is launching themselves and all that pent up envy and anger and hate at Bort. You know, unfortunately for Daya, like Bort's not really in that place where they're impressed with such with such a display. Um, they've reached a, content- a contentment with life that Daya just can't touch. And even when um, Bort breaks into pieces, all they say is, you've changed, Dee Dee, with that sort of really content smile on their face. Um, with Daya specifically, I just, I wonder where all their kindness went. Because that was, again, something I really liked about them, and also partly why I hated Bort so much, because I thought they were just totally emotionally abusing Daya. Um, so despite Daya's inferiority complex, they were sort of kind to everyone, including Foz. Um, and so I wonder, like, was that all just a charade, and who they became on the moon? Was the real Daya, like, hoity-toity, really inflated ego, um, condescending gem um or was earth dia the real dia and that airheaded idol life on the moon like their life on the moon just sort of got to their head and just buried all of the goodness under that okay well padpa the eternally cool gem and retail like the white madness who carries around a thousand oh, what was it dismantling tools um these two had like a great love and respect for each other but despite Distorted by what all the gems struggled with in their own way, which is to what purpose can an immortal aspire to without eventually dying on the inside? Um, and a potential solution that Retail themselves expressed was like a cruel but useful job assignment can be a very effective anesthetic for any questions one might have about one's existence. Um, you know, talking about cinema, but really just as applicable to themselves as anyone. Because for a retail, that cruel job assignment was fixing Padpa. And you can tell how that was the only thing that had held them together for all their life. Because as soon as Padpa was taken to the moon, retail absolutely fell apart. And what was sad about that is that while I don't think retail ever admitted it to themselves, fixing Padpa wasn't about fixing Padpa. You know, it was about them proving they could do it. Um, and when Retail saw Padpa again, just standing and moving about after they'd gone back from the moon, they were still super angry and just attacked, kept attacking Padpa. Yes, at the betrayal of seemingly siding with Foss and the Lunarians, but it was also obvious that Retail's anger had to do with how the Lunarians were able to do in just a few weeks what Retail could never do in hundreds of years. Padpa, Padpa is a badass with a capital B, um, loved by all the other gems, you know, a great battle strategist, observant, whip smart, like probably the only gem who could have put a real stopper on Ikimia's grand plan if they really wanted to, but of course they didn't, you know, because Padpa is also the ultimate jaded gem, you know, they've seen it all, lived it all, and they just want to rest in peace, which I guess explains why they sided with Foss real hard from the get-go, um, like the first time they woke up for a total of five seconds, you know, P- Padpa gave Foss that widely quoted advice to tread carefully, but interestingly Padpa never once discouraged Foss from seeking the truth. I think it was because when you're so jaded, like seeing someone go against the grain, even if it'll break this idyllic existence everyone's grown used to is something to root for. Um, And on the moon, you know, Padpa was grateful and even felt indebted to Foss to the point where they agreed to help fight the Earth Shams. And to be honest, I was a bit puzzled over why Foss, I mean, why Padpa backed Foss up so much. Um, But again, it seems it stemmed from like, you know, having been experimented on for so long without any results and living life in like these five second spurts. That once Padpa was able to get their life back and actually live it properly, they felt they owed Foss more than they could repay. Um, and on Foss's part, it was so cute. Like, they did say once that Padpa would be the gem that they would want to be when they grew up. Which, as with a lot of other textual foreshadowings that only really hit you way later in the story, kind of also came true. Because Padparadja, which is a Sanskrit word, describes the colour of the lotus flower, and of course that is symbolically aligned with enlightenment. Um, So just another little detail to add to this 
massive mountain of symbolisms pointing to Foss's enlightened progression from gem to human to divine being. Ghost and Cangorm slash princess I feel were the most complicated pair of gems in terms of thinking about issues of self-identity. Um, even more so than Foss who is already super complex. Um, because Foss started out as one original gem, whose inclusions gradually adapted to more and more foreign materials, whereas Ghost and Kangorm were born together, like their body and their thoughts and actions were intertwined from day one. Um, and I love, loved how Ichikawa ran with the idea of creating two amalgamated characters inspired by actual ghost courts, which is like a gemstone that grows over other gems, and just explored the unique um, psychological uncertainty that arises out of not ever really having your own physical and mental space, um, which becomes super important later on when Kangol meets Ikmia and is presented with a choice, you know, um, and an entirely new way of thinking about themselves as their own separate gem. For the very short time that we got Ghost, I loved them. They were so sweet and I guess like melancholy, just like a quiet one who hung out at the library a lot. And I thought it was really cool that their weapon was a scythe, um, which has some like heavy symbolic associations to the Grim Reaper and the Greek god Cronus and I guess just generally the impermanence of things, this idea that all living things eventually must die, that even gods can be ravaged by the passage of time. Um, and there are like points about the division of free will between Ghost and Cangom that I don't think we'll ever really get to the bottom of. At times, you know, there were inconsistencies with how both gems described who was really in control. Like Ghost would talk about how the gem inside them would listen to Lapis and always wanted to be around Lapis. Um, that Cangom was the reason why they jumped onto the Lanarian without thinking to check if Lapis was there. Um, however, by the time that Ghost is stripped away and Kangom has that life-changing conversation with Ikmia about how everything they ever did was against their own will because of the remnants of Ghost still stuck in their eye, that seems to fly against what Ghost said. Um, it also flies against what actually happened when Foss first woke up. Like, Kangom was furious Ghost had been taken and had punched Foss three times. Um, so... A few things make me think Ikmia oversold the idea of Kangom never having free will while Ghost was part of them, and particularly of the notion that they had only been forced to be kind to Foss. Like, it sort of smells a bit like when Ikmia was talking about freedom, the freedom that Congo gave to the gems, how it was just a ploy to make them more into humans. Um, so I'm still of the mind that, um, Foss and Kangorm did develop a genuine relationship, like, on Kangorm's own terms. You know, Foss was the one who helped Kangorm take that huge step of accepting their own name, and Kangorm even said at the time that that really made it feel like Ghost was gone, you know? Um, and also Kangorm reciprocated that help, like, by, for example helping Foss reflect on how they need to deal head on with these hallucinations that they keep having of Antark, you know. It's also thanks to Kangom that we get Ponytail Foss. Um, however, you know, Foss definitely also took Kangom for granted and was an asshole to them, and that kind of helped, you know, Kangom's internal struggle with figuring out whether they're actually just being controlled by Ghost. It's one of those, like, what-ifs that we'll never know, you know, whether Foss being genuinely kind to Kangorm would have changed the trajectory of events, you know, particularly after they go to the moon. Given Ikmir's, like, pre-obsession with Kangorm's arm, even before they had ever met the gem, I have this weird feeling that I can't substantiate with any proof, but that you know, that he had a strong motivation to completely remake Kangorm in the way that he wanted, and that he'd say anything he had to do that, you know. Plus, more practically, like, taking Kangom out from under Foss weakened Foss, and was, in my opinion, like, another element that 
further their descent into desperation and madness. Like, Kangon was real and pragmatic, and along with Padpa, was an anchor for Foss's sanity. And Foss lost that, you know, after Kangon's transformation into princess. And <laughs> it is no secret that I thought Kangon's character shift after becoming princess was jarring to say the least and I know it was you know because the last bits of ghost had been scraped away and so their real self could come out instantly but also I can't shake that feeling that there's more to it than that um I just thought it's ironic that Ikmia trained Kangom to think for themselves but in a way Kangom at least at first took all their cues to build their new identity from Ikmia. Also not a secret was my struggle to accept the Ikmia Kangom relationship. Um, the romance kind of like landed like a stealth bomb and you know there were issues with informed consent and it seemed Kangom was just another chess piece in Ikmia's grand plan to unite the lustrous and the Lunarians. Um, however I do have to say that the relationship grew on me later like when you see that they have become more equal partners in their relationship um like bottom line is i loved most the version of kangum that they were on earth and i hate that along with every other gem they didn't have access to like actual professional therapy to sort out their mental health issues i really feel like had they had that um they would have had a chance to come to terms with themselves as is you know because i always felt like ken Gom's situation with ghost is analogous to us as humans where we have certain people in our lives who shape our identity and our beliefs in a huge way especially when we're young and even if that influence has some kind of negative impact on us, like usually it's a good, it's a mix of like both good and bad. The solution isn't to forget and wipe everything and start from scratch, you know. I mean, for us, that's impossible, <laughs> but also because it's often the case that there's lessons to be learned from the pain in your past and it can turn us into better people with a clearer view of life and the world. And we can take those lessons that we learned from others um, into the future you know at least that's my view like I don't dispute that princess has a great life now you know but I do wonder um, at that lost opportunity for Ken Gum to have accepted that part of themselves that was inextricably linked to ghost yellow maybe the most innocent gem out of them all um i gotta say like Foss really messed yellow up by forcing them to attack the earth gems even when yellow didn't want to do it um and they never recovered after that like seeing padba be broken destroyed yellow like it was the straw on the camel's back after suffering a long, long lifetime of losing partners and just for feeling responsible for their loss, you know. And even before going to the moon, there was that latent desperation there in yellow, like a fear that any gem who partnered with them would eventually be taken away or shattered, you know, which is why they so readily agreed to Zircon being partnered up with Port. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna say like yellow outside of Foss is strong competition for the title of most screwed up gem. Let's talk Jade and Yuke, the number one stable couple with like Yuke holding the true seat of power and then Jade, her loyal second in command. And like we've already talked about Yuke's flaws, like they're a leader of the earth gems but have displayed questionable strategic sense at times, especially the decision to carry out that preemptive strike against Foss, Padba and Yellow, um, which turned out to be a critical factor in mess in like making Foss like increase their antagonism, especially because Cinnabar participated in the attack to protect Bort. Maybe Yuk couldn't have foreseen the craziness of that fight, as well as Kangom showing up out of nowhere to disrupt a potential reconciliation, but they definitely had more options on the table than the nuclear one. What Yuk does have going for them though is that they care a lot for the gems that look to them for their leadership. It's something that Yuk criticized Lapis for. Like it was Lap it was like Lapis had more fun satisfying their intellectual curiosity than actually using it to benefit the gems in any way. So, you know, despite the pretty big mistakes that they've made, I think I still think Yuke's heart is in the right place and they have really have that collective vision in mind. Um, even if they don't have the strategic 
brains of someone like Padpa or Cinnabar. And um, all I have to say about Jade is like, I guess they're more of a doer than a thinker, which I guess applies to most of the gems, but it's eminently obvious with Jade. Um, although they were a total badass in that last confrontation with Foss. Alex, I mean, <laughs> their evolution from lead Linarian hater to restaurant CEO, just smiling contentedly at serving Linarians their Alex special was just really gratifying. Like, unlike Daya, I appreciated that Alex is able to let go of the past, although in saying that, maybe they let go a bit too much because it seemed like they had also completely forgotten about their desire to see Chris Beryl again. Um, and to this day, I still don't know what made Alex hang on to the promise that they made to Foss like 200 years ago to turn into Red Alex in an attack against the Earth Gems. Like, a promise Foss themselves at the time had said was unnecessary. <laughs> you know, it still feels like a slightly contrived plot point to me and... I would have believed it if they did it out of fear. Like, Foss was pretty, pretty like, threatening, even to the moon gems at the end. But yeah, anyway. The only really asshole move I can um, credit to Alex was, like, in true Foss style, completely overriding Benito's free will and just forcing them to become the Red Alex handler. Um, Amethyst, 84 and 33. You know, the fascinating thing about our twin gems is how, as we got into later volumes, the distinction of Amethyst being a whole made of two halves, like 84 and 33, sort of fell away. And by the end, we had one whole Amethyst on the moon who, kudos to them, insisted on continuing with restoring the ground up gems and sort of took care of Yellow when their mind broke, even though it was too late. Um, and then one whole gem Amethyst on Earth. Um, although, like, Earth Amethyst sort of winks out of existence in the story. Like, we only really get one line from them saying how they know that 84 is doing just fine on the moon. Um, that unbreakable twin connection, though, and the lack of, like, enmity between them, or really, like, a lack of antagonism between most of the moon and Earth gems really showed that this war is really not what any of them want. Um, and now that they're reunited, like, the thing I'm looking forward to the most in the coming volumes are all of the reactions to the former gem pairs seeing each other again, you know, or at least, you know, I hope we do get conversations around what it means now that they're back together again and how much of the relationship issues of the past and the guilt they will carry forward to the moon. Because of the size of the cast, like, of course, there are going to be gems who don't get too much screen time or like page time, but they were given enough personality to really round out the gem family you know like there's goshen the badass free willing degenerate um i mean baby goshen um og morga was like a favorite of mine because of their bite and just how they antagonized foss um and you know what like the promise that foss made to baby morga has also come true like they had said to Baby Morga that they'd make sure they get to meet OG Morga one day, and I'm assuming that's already happened with all the gems being restored as Lunarians. Um, there's also Benito and Nepti, who is the gem pair I wish we'd had more time to get into because I find the nature of their tension like really fascinating. Like the insecure normie versus the oblivious cool weirdo. So those are the gems, but what about the Admirables? Like, to me, they have been the most helpless, passive faction of the three. They are looked down on by both the Lustrous and the Lunarians, um, just tossed around by circumstances at, completely outside of their control. And what I want to find out most, um, which I don't know if we'll ever touch on again in the story, is which version of history, like Ventricosis's or Ichmia's, um, about how the Admirables ended up on the moon is true, or like to be more precise, like which version is closest to the truth? Were they taken by force or was it a kindness done to a dying race? Um, it is a fact though that for some reason the Linarians have kept the Admirables in that state of mindlessness that we see them on in the moon. Um, and they probably have the tech to fix that, like given everything that they've done for the gems. But at this point in time, they still haven't, you know, 
Remember Ikmir's grand vision of all three races being united? Like that vision so far, at least from what we've seen, doesn't really seem to include um, a restoration of the Averabolus's senses. Um, also remember Variegatus had said to Foss that they intend to go to the moon to rescue their comrades, which is what gave Foss the idea to go to the moon in the first place. So I wonder if that is going to be a major plot point in the next volumes and if the Admirables will like come back in force um, in this new like 10,000 year era. This last section of the review I'm going to call like Musings of the Armchair Critic. I think Hoseki no Kuni is one of the best, most original fantasy stories I've ever come across. But even the best of stories suffer from some weaknesses. And I think those weaknesses arose as a result of both the size of the cast and the sheer number of plot points that Ishikawa had to get through. Um, so inevitably, like some important details either like one, weren't explained at all when an explanation really was needed, or two, were retconned much later and sometimes like unconvincingly. Or three was like spoon fed to us super quickly for the sole purpose of being able to progress to the next major plot development at the expense of it feeling um, quite unearned. Um, so now retconning, which means adding like new information that changes how you interpret past events, that's not always a bad thing. You know, it really depends on how it's done. Um, if done like convincingly and naturally, it adds freshness to the story and depth. But if a retcon like contradicts something that's been established before or isn't really rooted in anything that we've seen before and just appears out of nowhere, it can sort of leave a bad taste in your mouth. Um, now, I don't think Hoseki has any weaknesses that tarnishes the narrative as a whole, like far from it. But there were things or like plot points that left me sort of scratching my head or wishing it had been given more breathing space and more explanation. Um, for example, like how did Lapis actively choose to store their inclusions in their head as well as store a specific message with those specific inclusions? Because that was the first and only time we hear of inclusions being something that's controllable and compartmentalizable, um, which would have been like fascinating to explore more of, but I guess we just have to accept that Lapis was like brilliant beyond comprehension, which I'm sure they were, <laughs> but yeah. Um, also, like what the heck happened when Kangom was having that conversation with Ikmia? And suddenly, like, an apparition of ghost appears and grabs Antark by the shoulder and starts to rip them apart and drag them across the floor. Like, I don't believe we were ever given an explanation for what that was. Um, I've already also mentioned this as something I thought was superfluous and just sort of ended up not being a very important part of the story, and that's Ikmir's explanation of Congo's supposed armor of love. Like, the concept itself is interesting, but it kind of starts to fall apart when you realize the whole, it gets stronger the longer you're exposed to it theory is disproven by one how quickly the youngest earth gems come to love congo as well as remembering that lapis wasn't a young gem and had been exposed to congo for a long time but was also the most critical when it came to questioning congo's intentions for them um so those things are small though like compared to the major retconning i felt happened in the last volumes like when through either Ikmia or Barbada, like literally reciting history and explaining it to the moon gems, we're given a lot of information that felt like shortcuts that had to be taken in order to condense the story to a more manageable size. I'm thinking like the reveal of Congo's evil AI brother, who apparently was able to cause the first meteor to hit. Like there's no lead up to that reveal and there's no follow up either, which makes me feel like it was put there only to explain why Congo was so restricted in his actions and like I would have loved to look more into why the AI went rogue and if it has something to do with how terrible humans were. Then there's like the eye slows, how we found out that they were human too, but we're not given an explanation for why they weren't also turned into Lenarians. Um, the memories of all the gems that they suddenly find buried in ice on another moon and then the sudden invention of the gem to Lenarian transformation machine. Um, even the way that Ikmia talks about how he learnt that Congo would be more likely to pray for a pseudo-human built from a gem, like, the explanation is it was just something that he learnt. You know, his reason for why Foss in particular was 
the gem most suited to that role. Like it makes sense, you know, that he saw how ambitious they were and yet they were restricted by a super fragile body. But in terms of how Ikemia knew Foss's inclusions would physically respond to foreign materials like they did, when we know for a fact that no other gem had such inclusions, like we don't really know how he came to know. And for like how much the Lunarians invest in Foss for their salvation, it would have been like more satisfying, I guess, to have seen that process of Ikemia's discovery. And finally, and I mentioned this already too, like we didn't get to see any of the thoughts, uh, the gem's thoughts, um, except for Yuk, um, and that was like one page on being turned into Lunarians, really, against their will. Like, in the last chapter, it looked like everyone's accepted it and happy to live in Ikemia's new city, but honestly, if we don't get any flashbacks or pushback or some kind of discussion uh, amongst the Earth Gems, that, to me, would be one of the bigger gaps that's probably not as forgivable. So those are the things that I felt like briefly exposed how this sprawling, gargantuan, complicated story was maybe getting spread a little bit too thin and that they were the bits that needed to be cut or shortened to make way for the story to continue. Um, and of course, there were so many other aspects of the lore and the different races and how inclusions worked that I enjoyed immensely. And so to me, these like, positive, super imaginative aspects of Hosei and Akuni far outweigh any weird jumps or gaps that there are. And I guess that brings me to the end of my rant. I honestly, guys, I must have broken my record for the longest rant ever on this channel. Um, thank you. And I really have no more words to say other than I'm exhausted and thank you so much, so, 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 so much for watching along with me and reading along with me. And I, yeah, I really, really look forward to discussing more about Hosek and Okuni with you all. And yeah, I'm sure we'll be speaking very soon. So until then, take care guys. And yeah, until Ichika releases some more chapters, um, I'll see you for the next Hosek and Okuni reaction whenever that will be.